Okay, Mr. Marshall, let's see. We are live. We are recording. You are the co-host to this meeting. Uh, I see 634. You have a quorum of the board. You look good to go to me. Okay. Thank you, Pam. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of March 6th, 2024. My name is Doug Marshall, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I'm calling this meeting to order at 635 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is accessible on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda where the Zoom link is, is listed at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and return to mute. Bruce Colden. I'm here. Uh, let's see, no sign of Fred Hartwell yet. Um, and we know Jesse Major is absent tonight. I, Doug Marshall, am present. Janet McGowan? Here. Johanna Newman? Here. And Karen Winter? Here. Thank you all. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. To the general public, the general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comments may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate by the planning board chair. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the public meeting, uh, the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can typically express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the meeting. Okay, the time now is 6.38. And uh, we will start with the first item on the agenda, which are the minutes of February 7th. I trust everyone had a chance to look at those. Uh, does anyone have any comments on those minutes? Uh, Bruce. Um, yes, uh, only um, that uh, on page 13, there, there's a reference to uh, the number of uh, poles on the athletic field. And as everybody knows, I've been kind of interested in those, but the minutes record that there are four of them and I believe there are actually six. But other than that, um, they seem to be, as usual, quite accurate and quite thorough. All right. These are light poles? Uh, yeah, yes, they are light poles. They're very big ones, but yes, that's what they're for. Okay. Uh, Chris, are you okay with that edit? Okay, it looks like she's shaking her head yes. In that case, are there any other comments? All right, would anyone like to move that we adopt these minutes with this one edit from Bruce? Johanna. I move that we adopt the minutes from February 7th as amended. Okay, and I will second the motion. 
Any further comments before we go to our vote? All right. Uh, Bruce, we'll start with you. Uh, I approve. All right, thank you. Um, Janet? Um, I'm gonna abstain because I didn't attend the meeting. Okay. Johanna? Approve. Karen? Approve. And I as well approve. So we have four in favor, one abstention and two absences. Chris? Excuse me, hi. Um, apparently there's someone in the building who wants to come to the planning board meeting. I don't know who that would be, but I need to go and check. So I will be back in a minute. All right. Thank you, Chris. All right. Um, I guess we can go on to our second item. Uh, time now is 640 and we'll go to public comment. And I'm seeing that we have 17 attendees in the public. And I guess at this time, if anybody wants to make a public comment, please raise your hand. I typically read the names of the people that I can see uh, as attendees at this time. So I'll start with that. And while I'm doing that, uh, again, people who want to make a public comment, please raise your hand. I will remind you that public comments at this time should be about things that are not showing up later on our agenda. So we have Letitia LaFollette, Barry Roberts, Brad Hutchinson, Carol Lewis, Claire Bertrand, uh, Gabrielle, Gail Flood, John Kuhn, Jonathan Salvan, Kenneth Roberts, Kent Farber, Pam Rooney, Patrick Cobbs, Philip Henry, Ruoki Zong, Sharon Pov Povinelli, and Tom Reedy. All right, so I see one hand. Uh, Pam, if you could bring Letitia LaFollette in. Hi, can you Welcome, hear me? Letitia, please give us your name and your street address and you have three minutes. Okay, great. Um, thank you. My name is Letitia LaFollette. I live at 18 Dana Street. Um, I've lived at Dana Street for 35 years. Um, and I wanted to comment on, I'm, I'm sorry, when I came into the meeting, I couldn't see the agenda, but I wanted to comment on um, the, the site plan review of the Barry Roberts building in the um, uh, in the, the old Hastings building. The okay, so that is going to be uh, on our agenda. Probably so I shouldn't comment on next that. item. Okay. So I will ask you to hold your comment on that. Okay, so we'll, but I'll have a chance to talk later. Is you will. Right? Okay, great. Thank you very much. All right. Are there any other members of the public that would like to make a comment? Okay, so uh, I guess uh, I don't see any hands, so we will assume there are no further public comments this evening and move on. Time now is 6.43, and we will go on to the third item on the agenda, the joint public hearing, site plan review, and special permit. So this is a joint public hearing to request a site plan review approval under section 3.325 of the zoning bylaw to redevelop a mixed use building, including rehabilitating the existing mercantile building, also called the Hastings building, removing a rear L of that building and the adjacent Brown building and constructing a new five-story residential building at the rear of the site the project to contain 22 dwelling units in combination with ground floor retail, commercial space, and a connecting structure containing a lobby, an elevator, and a stair, and to request a special permit in accordance with section 9.22 of the zoning bylaw to allow a reduction in non-conforming lot coverage from 100% to 97%, and to relocate the non-conforming retaining wall and section Oh, okay, and the, a special permit in accordance with section 515.171 of the zoning bylaw to allow payment in lieu of affordable units. 
MAP 14A, parcel 250 and 281 in the BG, um, TC and DR and MPD zoning district. So this is all, uh, I guess I should have started with the subject, which is the SPR 2024-05 and SPP 2024-04, all at South, Ple South Pleasant Street LLC, uh, located at 45 and 55 South Pleasant Street. Okay, so it looks like we've brought in Tom Reedy, uh, John Kuhn, and Barry Roberts to represent this project. Welcome, uh, gentlemen, and uh, I don't know which of you wants to give, give us the start, uh, but you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, members of the board. For the record, Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson out of Amherst here on behalf of South Pleasant Street, LLC. And it's, as you noted, uh, application for site plan approval for a mixed use development at 4555 South Pleasant Street. Uh, we are also asking for only two of those three special permits. We're asking for essentially a finding um, on the lot coverage. So the lot is currently 100% covered. We are looking to reduce that to 97%, 95% what's allowed in that zoning district. So even though we're making it better, we're not achieving that 95%. And so we need a finding from the board uh, that the change, the reduction is, quote, not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing nonconformity, which obviously we would suggest that uh, you can make that finding. And we're also asking for a special permit to allow the payment of $1,124,400 in lieu of providing three affordable units uh, within the, the building. Um, the last uh, special permit that was mentioned was the relocation of that retaining wall. Uh, Barry's decided not to relocate that retaining wall, so we no longer need any relief uh, from the rear yard setback for that relocation. And so with me this evening, I've got John Kuhn, uh, architect emeritus from uh, Kuhn Riddle Architects, who's going to probably start us off, give a little bit of the background and, and genesis of this project. Pam, we also have Jonathan Salvon in the audience, mm -hmm. if you want to bring him okay. on as a panelist. So hopefully there's a smooth transition between John and Jonathan. Uh, we also have Phil Henry in the audience. He, he can join um, to answer any questions. He's the site engineer. So if the board has any questions about drainage, accessibility, any site related uh, comments, he's the one to answer. And then obviously uh, Barry Roberts is here as well, um, the, the developer. And so I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to let John, uh, let me see, take it away from here. John, direct me as you will, uh, and I can hopefully drive the bus. Uh, John, you are muted. You're muted. <laughs> There we go. I'll start over again. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, good evening, Planning Board. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, we appreciate this opportunity to present this project. Um, I thought what we would do is I will give a brief uh, sort of a history of a little bit of a brief history of of the building and and then of the project itself. And there is a um, an aerial photograph uh, or rendering that I think is probably helpful for telling the story here. I think you can all locate the, the Hastings building there. Um, this, this section of uh, Amherst uh, along South Pleasant Street is called Merchants Row. Most of it was designed by an architect named William Fennel Pratt, who uh, was very renowned in the area. He designed Northampton City Hall, the, uh, the Dickinson House, the Hills House, and uh, most of these commercial buildings, as, as well as many of the, the, uh, the beautiful buildings downtown Northampton. Um, these were all built in the late 19th century, 1879 to 1890 or so. Um, in 1914, Asa, Asa J. Hastings uh, opened uh, Hastings store uh, on South Pleasant Street, not at the present location, but that, that was opened in 1914. Uh, so the business was in, in uh, Hastings was in business for 108 years. 
1937, he moved it into the present location at 45 South Pleasant Street, where it was until uh, 2022. Uh, he passed the, the, the business along to his son, Don Hastings, um, and he and his wife, Phyllis, uh, ran it for, for many years. Uh, Don was, uh, interestingly enough, a, 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 an alum of Amherst College, lived on uh, North Prospect Street. And I remember when we first moved to town, I used to see he and Phyllis walking to Hastings uh, many mornings. Uh, Don uh, and Phyllis eventually turned the store over to their son, Dave, David, who was uh, married to Mary Broll. Um, David unfortunately died in an accident in 1997, and uh, Mary took over the store. In 1988, Sharon Povinelli, uh, who had graduated from UMass, also started working at Hastings. And so when, uh, when David passed away, Mary and Sharon uh, took over the running of Hastings, and, uh, and they own the building today. And as you all know, they they ran it uh, until uh, the June of 2022, um, at which time they had to close it, which is kind of, uh, I think everybody has felt the, the passing of, of Hastings. And um, this, this is a, a valuable piece of real estate. It's, it's their legacy in many ways. And so they have been wondering what to do with the building. Um, early last year, uh, they they asked me to come in and and take a look at it um, and and discuss what they might do with the the upper floors and uh, particularly the the L to the rear. Um, before I jump into that, however, I think I should also point out the Brown Building, which is at 55 South Pleasant Street, right there, uh, was also a historic building at some point in time, but has probably undergone so many changes over the years that there's there's nothing uh, of any note left there. Um, that uh, building uh, was a bookstore uh, that many of you may remember, the Jeff, Jeffrey Amherst Bookstore, which I believe opened in, in um, 1937. Its last owners was, were uh, Joy and, and Howard Gersten, and they closed the bookstore in 2009. While it's had a, a couple of tenants upstairs, the, the first floor tenancy has been vacant um, uh, for 15 years. So that, uh, that building comes into play in the, in the discussion here. Um, so I met Mary and, and Sharon uh, early last year uh, to, to look at what might be done with the building. And the L in the back, they were interested in maybe putting a couple of apartments. But I, I was struck by two things. Uh, one was that it was gonna be very expensive, especially given today's codes, particularly energy codes to convert that into um, apartments and it, for a reasonable amount of money. And secondly, I was, I was, I guess I'd always seen the, 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 the parcel back there, but as you, as you can see on the, on the map to the right there, um, that kind of highlighted gray space is the parcel. And if you take off the L and you take, take down the brown building, the existing building is, is about a quarter of the site. So it really is a site that's fairly large and, and uh, in many ways underutilized. So um, I suggested that, they, that we should really look at uh, building a building behind the existing building, restore the building that is there, the historic structure itself. And in that conversation, Barry Roberts got involved and suggested that perhaps we should look at seeing if that the, the building, the Brown building of 55 could be, uh, could be purchased. And that did take place. And that opened up a lot of different possibilities. Um, as, we, as we got into the, into the design of this, uh, the, the zoning allows a five-story building at 55 feet. Um, one of the problems with that is that a five-story building at that you know, which is approximately 11 feet per floor and a building like the existing Hastings, which has floor, uh, floor to floor heights that are 12 or 13 feet, the two, the two buildings don't line up. So what made sense was to try to create a uh, uh, connection between the, the, the new building and the old building that would allow for those differences in floor heights. 
Um, the, the first thought was really to look at perhaps expanding um, the existing building over where uh, 55 South Pleasant is now. But in reality, that didn't really allow for that much additional square footage. It was going to be expensive to, to add there. And what made the most sense was to clear that building out and, and create a nice uh, space between the Brody building to the south and 45 South Pleasant to the north. And um, if, if we go, I guess, to the next slide, I think you see a good, uh, this is a good site plan. So here you can see in the upper right-hand corner, the existing Hastings building. To the south of that, um, that's, there you go, that's uh, 55. And then up there to the left is the, the existing L to the back of it, which was three stories, but also didn't line up with the existing building. So our thoughts were to uh, demolish these two buildings. Uh, a demolition um, permit was applied for and a demolition delay of six months was put on uh, both structures and that six months will be up in April. Um, if you go to the next slide, I think you see the basic part T here, which was to construct a building uh, setting it back a little over 10 feet on all sides and uh, connecting it with uh, a building that, or a section, a connector that allows for elevators, stairways, entries, and that kind of thing. And the space between the two buildings, and uh, Jonathan will get into the details of this, of this design, but um, allowed for us to maintain vehicular access, one-way access that's there now, uh, pedestrian access, uh, transformer, bike racks, entries and that type of thing. So in the end, it made more sense to be respectful of the existing building, uh, both the, the, the east facade toward the common, but also the south facade and push all the new structure to the rear. Um, so I, I did some, some drawings uh, with uh, Mary and Sharon and Barry and, and worked through some, some concepts and uh, over the summer and then uh, in the early uh, fall, this was turned over to, to Jonathan Salvan and Kian Riddle to develop uh, what you'll see now. So I just wanted to give a little bit of a background as to how, to the, how the, uh, the design came to be. And uh, Jonathan, if you want, I'll, I'll plug in here and there as needed. But uh, if you want to take it from here, you can begin to talk about uh, uh, the more, more details about the design. Sure. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to kind of walk around the or go around the building, uh, you know, a little bit uh, in the next slide that with a little bit more detail. We're going to look at some exterior views um, and then we'll get into a little bit of the organization of the building and the inside, um, which I think will kind of, kind of tie back somewhat to what John was talking about um, uh, with this notion of, of a kind of block in the back, a block in the front and a connector piece. Um, I, I should make sure that now I'm that I'm prattling on that folks can't actually hear me. The last yeah. time I was at a meeting, I was sounding like a chicken apparently. Um, so this next slide is, is very similar to what John uh, was just showing you, but with a little bit of color to kind of differentiate some of the different pieces. Um, so again, at that that uh, right-hand side front, um, you know, along South Pleasant Street uh, is the, the existing Hastings building uh, due south of that or down on the page is that kind of new entry plaza that we've been talking about, um, which takes you, you know, an accessible path uh, from the sidewalk at the streets uh, up to the to the front door, uh, which will be in this connector part of the building, uh, which will serve as the vertical circulation um, for both parts of the building. Uh, the, the front part of the Hastings building, the first floor of the Hastings building, is going to continue to be a mercantile space. If folks have seen the papers, I'm sure you know that that you know the Amherst College store is coming into this space. The rear um, first floor will be amenity space, and we'll have a more detailed plan of that coming up in a little while. But that that's all going to be related to the residential uses. So the the front portion remains mercantile. The rear portion is amenity and support space for the residential spaces on both all the floors above this in both the existing building and the new building. Um, just to kind of continue to walk around the site a little bit here, as shown in that kind of light gray, as John was saying, along the south side 
uh, is the the driveway. It's really the same width driveway that there is today. There just isn't a building right up against the edge of it for the first third or half. Um, and then uh, continuing north and then back east uh, is, is going to be new uh, hardscape paving that will uh, replace the, the asphalt that's there today. Uh, that'll get all chewed up during the, the process of construction. Um, at the southwest corner of our new building, uh, there will be two pull-in spaces uh, to provide a you know an accessible parking place and a, a park parking place for you know you know whether it's a, a drop off, you know, someone delivering a package or something like that. You know, just one more convenient space. We're not obviously going to be able to meet um, the parking demands of potential residents on the site given its constraints. Um, I think we can move to the next slide. So this is this sort of reproduces the in the upper left here we have the same image that we had on our cover, um, but calling out some of what we're doing. Um, obviously the the yellow Hastings building remains in the front. We're taking the uh, that pink color and extending it around the south side of the building to kind of highlight the historic piece. Um, especially once that brown building comes down, um, it probably makes sense to kind of make a cohesive hole out of it. Behind that, you can see the uh, vertical, um, what's actually a stair tower and, and lobby space at each floor. The elevator is actually tucked uh, deeper into the um, the connector, but we'll we'll get to that in a moment. You can see we're trying to create a some seating opportunities and some and bicycle uh, locations in this front plaza. Uh, we have a covered walkway, um, and you get a good comparison of of kind of the, the before and after here. Um, you know, it's a relatively narrow space, but we feel like placing the the main mass of the of the new building at the back kind of draws your eye in and does a great job of kind of reducing the scale of of a, of what is a five story building. Let's move to the next slide. This is a view, these are some views from the south, but we also have tucked in the, the upper right here, some examples of the materials we're going to be using. Um, the base all the way around the building will be a brick masonry, except at that, that tower. Um, and then the upper levels will be a combination of different colors and different textures of a, a metal panel system. And again, uh, on that you know, the, the front part of the site where the Hastings building is, we're going to be adding some additional windows uh, where the Brown building is now to provide better, uh, you know, natural light into the apartments that will be created at that level. I think we can move on and feel free to, to interrupt me with questions if, if, if folks want. I don't want to lose it. Folks to have to, you know, lose thought as we're moving around the building. Uh, on the upper right is a view from the, the cinema parking lot. Uh, uh, Jonathan, you have your first question. Bruce. Oh, Bruce. Um, Jonathan, uh, one of the questions that we raised at, at some point, I think, is the uh, rooftop mechanicals. I think you've got screening, but these are excellent uh, images to point out. I particularly, for example, was interested from the Fleet or Bank of America parking lot here in the upper right. It looks like... Uh, uh, it looks like you you can't see much uh, on the roof from there. These no. other, these other uh, rooftop uh, are they screen mechanicals? Yeah, let me let me, let me point them out. So if we if we look at the the what we're calling the west elevation here, the first uh, that first sloped object you see um, that that's actually the stair access to the to the roof. Um, then the long linear piece that that is the screening. So that is that is the screening that we're providing for the the rooftop mechanical equipment. Um, I, I a page or two down, we actually have a section through it, but I think we're proposing something that's either four, six, or five feet high. And then that last uh, uh, piece, um, that that's really the, the parapet of the tower at the front. And hmm. again, when you look at it from the north, you can kind of see the the, the access stair and the, then the longer side of the uh, space or the screening for the for the mechanical equipment. And the, you know these obviously these are computer renderings and computer views, um, but we have in fact modeled the the size of the uh, the screen 
uh, on the roof. So that view that you're seeing from the cinema parking lot, um, we feel accurately depicts the fact you won't really even see the screening, never mind the equipment from, from that side of the building. And just so we're clear here, the top two images are west elevations uh, the 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 well uh, west elevations the one on the left here where your arrow is is a is a clinical elevation so yes. you do see the uh, mechanicals up on the top there but the the one on the right as I understand it is a, a perspective rendering and probably because the mechanicals are set back you don't actually see them so although what we see here in the west elevation shows very clearly mechanicals it's if I'm understanding it correctly, you won't actually see them from the ground uh, unless you get unless you get back quite quite far. If yes. You get back to uh, Williamsburg or something like that. <laughs> Maybe not quite that far. Well, um, if down we roll, all the way to Hadley, that's the point. Yeah. <laughs> if we if we scroll back a page, um, just just so that we we finish this topic before we get too far. Again, yeah. you know, you have that, that flat on view down at the bottom of the page that shows the screening. You can actually see the little bit of the door uh, when it comes to the, the kind of rooftop access. But again, from the ground, um, you'd have to be back a significant distance um, to, to see it. And if we go back to the prior slide um, a little bit more, there we go. Uh, you can just barely make out a tiny little piece of the uh, and that's actually the um, overrun on the elevator in that case. Um, and so it will be it'll be difficult to see the screening, never mind the the equipment. Good. I thought that would be the case, and I thought this was a good opportunity to make that uh, very clear to everybody. Yep. All right, thanks, Bruce. Uh, Johanna, you've got your hand up. Thank you. Uh, dangerous to open it up for questions this early. Uh, <laughs> but I could you go to the next slide, the a six? Perfect. Um, I'm just trying to, I, I worked in the Hastings building for about five years. So have a lot of spent, I'm just trying to understand what's happening on this uh, view one. So the white building kind of block is that's where laughing dog is now. Yes. That's where the bicycle shop is. Yes, exactly. And then what is the gray, grayish blue blob to the left? That is, um, I'm not sure, sure. John might recall what it's called, but it's it's on the it's, neighboring side. It's Bill Gillen's building. Yeah, the white one. Okay. Yep. I and, wasn't sure if that building had a name. And the retaining wall is there, so the cars yep. are pulled up to it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Helpful. Okay. All right. So if you scroll back down. Oh, Bruce, do you have another question or you still have your hand up? Sorry, Mr. Chair. I think I just <laughs> Should should have let you ask that question. Well, I know Bruce well enough to know that, <laughs> that's a legacy. Go ahead, Jonathan. So I think this is where we were. Um, I, would, I think we've touched on, on much of it, but again, you can see in these views that we're bringing that that brick band around, um, and we're we're uh, trying to break up the 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 kind of facades here by grouping some of the windows together. Um, you know, instead of just having lots of little punched openings. We're using trim and, and different textures of uh, the metal siding uh, to, to create some larger scale um, form and, and, and order on the facades. Let's move down one more. So we have some detailed views of the entry plaza. I'm going to start at uh, view one. You can see the uh, we have our signage and tucked behind the signage is the start of the of the ramp that goes under that canopy towards the the, uh, the front door, um, you can make out a little bit of uh, uh, of the bench and the uh, bike rack as well there and the plant, the three different planting beds, which we'll touch on a little bit more. Um, moving down on the page to, to kind of an, uh, a view from above with the canopy trimmed off. Um, again, you can see the, the pathway of the uh, ramp, that front bed and sign uh, location the larger, uh, longer planting area that, that has some evergreen plantings to, to screen uh, the transformer, and then a, a last planter uh, by the building as well. So we're proposing as part of this project that, you know, obviously the, the Amherst College store is going to go to the DRB with their own signage. I don't know that they've uh, 
put that application in yet or not. Um, but as part of this project, there's going to be two pieces of, of signage that we're suggesting. One is kind of a building marker for the residential piece. That's the, the brick uh, sign with the, the 55 uh, letters on it. And then as a kind of a historic acknowledgement of the you know century long uh, presence of, of Hastings in the building, we're adding uh, Hastings 1914 uh, in the upper part of the of the upper part of the, the front elevation. I probably should have pointed that out when we were a little further back, but if folks want us to scroll back, we can do that and, and show that at some point. Um, let's move on. Uh, Jonathan, oh, uh, yep. was the Historical Commission okay with the, your naming or marking the building in that way? I'm gonna ask Tom to, to draw on his memory on that one. There was... Uh... I don't know that we showed them this uh, rendering. I think we were just talking about the existing buildings that were coming down. Uh, so we have not asked them whether or not they're okay with it. We deferred to the building owners and they were okay with it. So that's why it's up there. Yeah, I don't think that had been developed yet, but it, but it was reviewed by the design review board. Yes. Yeah, okay, thank you. Let's move down to the next sheets. So in a, in a little bit more detail, this is kind of a combination of things. This does have some of the uh, the detail on the on the species of the plants, which unfortunately, at least on my screen, I can't read, but I can describe them if necessary. Um, but I think the piece that's uh, probably more important for, for kind of understanding the building um, is the, the notion of how this the new piece and the and the existing building kind of work together. So let's just scroll out a little bit, and you know, folks want. To talk about the plantings, we can return to that. Um, but again, you know, on the on the right side of the the page, we have the existing bookstore, um, and at the left side, we have the block of the new building. And in between, there is that this lobby space, an elevator core, um, and as I was describing earlier, the rest of this floor at the back uh, is either amenity space or support space for uh, the the residential uses above. And so there's a bike storage. Uh, room, a trash room, uh, some you know small amount of tenant storage, got a laundry, and, and then we have our second egress. And what do you mean by tenant amenity space? So it, it's sort of thought of as as kind of a lounge space. There would probably be some soft seating in there. Um, it's you know a lot of the a lot of the newer. Uh, residential, multifamily residential buildings have them. Sometimes they do gyms. I don't think that that would be the case here, but but the, the full use of that space has not been fully uh, programmed out yet. Okay. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything it, to that. Could it, could it potentially be commercial? No. No, so this is going to be residential space in, in one of the... in. Ms. Breastrip's development application report. Uh, she asked about the mixed use, meeting the mixed use definition. And Jonathan, you can correct me if I'm wrong or if you have the numbers in front of you. But this bookstore and its commercial nature is sufficient and meets that 30% for the entirety of what you have here. So there is no need to have any commercial space here. And so this would be dedicated to the residential use. Yeah, as I recall, we were at something like 37 or 38 percent. Right, no disagreement about all of that. I could just, you know, I could imagine that it might actually be viable as commercial at some point. So, but for the present time, it's it's residential. Correct. Correct. And, and I think we can, unless folks have other questions on this, I think I'd like to show you an example of one of the, the typical start showing some examples of the typical upper levels just so folks understand the, the relationship between the kind of the front and the back. Um, so again, at the risk of repeating myself, uh, the old building is on the right um, and we're able to fit the three units on two floors uh, in the historic part of the building. These are connected uh, via new hallway uh, to uh, an elevator core and short stair so that you know that because as john said the you know the old floor to floors at 12 and 13 feet don't don't line up very well with with floors that that are at about 10 6 at the moment 
Um, and so we've got a kind of a front and back elevator to allow folks to come in the one lobby at the bottom. And if they're in a wheelchair or need other help, um, they're able to, to get off at either the front side or the back side, gets them at one of the or other of the floor levels. Um, at the rear of the property, we're able to fit uh, four units um, in, a, in a variety of, of layouts. We have a two bedroom, a three bedroom and two fours at the back and then at the front, I think this is consistent between the, the second and third floors at the front. There's two one bedrooms and a three bedroom. I see that there are two doors between the two elevator lobbies and the old old building. Yeah, so there's a firewall at that location, and those doors will be on hold opens. Um, but in in the notion that either building would have to be able to kind of fall away if there were ever a catastrophic fire, which with a sprinkler system, we would hope would never occur. That's that's what the two sets of doors are. The other option would be to have kind of one of those fire shutters. Um, but at the moment, we're, we're doing pairs of doors. All right, uh, Janet, I see your hand. Doug, so far you're asking all my questions. <laughs> but uh, I'm, you know, one of my first questions when I was looking at um, through the packet the first time is, are these two buildings or is this one big building? Is this like an addition to the um, the Hastings building? So I don't really understand. So if I was a tenant on any of the floors in the Hastings buildings, could I walk and go visit my friends on yes. the same floor? And so so the doors could are freely opening. I didn't know what you yeah. meant. The doors would be on, on electronic hold opens. So they would be in the open position unless the alarms go off and the doors shut. Okay. Thank there you. There are other there are other ways to 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 do this. You know, there are these things that come down, you know, kind of rolling shutters that can come down from above. Um, but this is probably the simplest solution. So you wouldn't necessarily experience them on a day to day basis. Um, you wouldn't have to physically open them. But you know, if, if you come up in the elevator, uh, you can either get off, as I say, in the front, which is the lower side, um, and that serves the new building, or on the back side, uh, that's about depending on the floor, two to three feet higher, and so you have to kind of connect those two. And if you're just walking, there's a, a set of steps between the the two place, places. That's that's all I wanted to know. It was very yeah. clear. Yeah, but you are keeping the existing stair in the old building. Yes, it is going to in fact serve as as one of the ways out for that part of the building. And is that a fire stair? It is it is a fire stair today, you know, if we if which we're not going to do. If we were doing a gut rehab of the building, we would we would have to build that stair differently. But because it's an existing condition, um, we're we're permitted to keep the historic character of it. Okay. All right. I think we can move continually I, up. Can I ask building. one quick question that has to do with the stairwell in the front? Sure. Yeah. My understanding of the existing building is there are stair the stairs come in kind of off the street. Yeah. And you go oh there they are. Okay. Yeah. Great. And then it goes to the curling staircase. That is correct. Okay. And when we move up to the fourth floor, we're now at the roof level effectively of the uh the existing building. Um, so that we no longer have units on that side, and we have just the four new units um, in the new part of the building. Do the you actually floor. have a, an elevator lobby on the north of the elevator? Uh, it's not going to be a lobby. What we're, whether we build that space out or that's really just the, I think what we're seeing right now, honestly, is given the mismatch in the, in the uh, um, levels, that door you're seeing is actually the door below. Um, and this is the upper part of the third floor lobby. Okay. Very, very similar plan at the fifth floor. And the fifth floor will actually have a roof access to the uh, roof of the, uh, well, there's the roof access up the stair to the roof roof, but also to the roof of the Hastings building. And um, nope. well, Janet, go, you go ahead first this time. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering. I'm looking at the layout of these buildings. Are these are these um, 
three and four bedrooms aimed at students? Or in for family living? And I guess maybe I could ask this question too about like the prices of rents. Like who who do you think the tenants are or who are you aiming at? Because that looks kind of, um, that looks student E to me from what I understand this in this town. Sure. So I, I mean, it's market designed. Um, as far as rents go, I mean, again, I hate to say it, but it's, it's market. And so that's, you know, two bedroom, you're probably at, you know, $2,500, $2,900 a month, three bedroom, $3,500, $3,900, four bedroom, $4,500, $4,900 is probably what you're looking at um, per month for these. And you know, I think one of the things is the distinction, this has four beds, two baths. Oftentimes, you know, when I'm in front of this board or the zoning board, bed bath parity is one of the things that folks really look for as indicative of it being students, um, you know, no separate living facilities, et cetera. So this has its, its four bed, two bath. Um, and how do I say this? It, 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 I mean, it's a, I think a 6,000 square foot footprint. And so I give Coon Riddle an incredible amount of credit for fitting in what they were able to fit in uh, based upon what we're actually dealing with. With a, it's an urban design that can only go up five stories. Um, what is bed bathroom parity? I, I've never heard that what, term. So, so if you were had a if you had a four bedroom, you have a four bathroom. So, like that's parity meaning one for one. So, if you had three beds, you'd have three baths. Um, and you, so and, you you see that in for what kind of tenant? I'm kind of a little lost. Uh, student housing, undergraduate housing, particularly. That's typically what you would see is. Bedroom bathroom parity. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, looks like a question from Karen. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm happy to hear that. I was that was going to be my question. How many bathrooms? Because that I'm I'm looking at what kind of um, couple or who would perhaps be there instead of students. And <clears throat> I have a question. Is it at all, I, I talked at this site uh, review a little bit about that. Is there, have you ever looked at any possibility of putting something on the roof, making a kind of a roof garden? Um, if you could do anything like that, that would make it so much more attractive for a family or professor who wants to live in town in a, in a condo, uh, the way they love those condos that are on Amity Street. Is that a possibility? And I heard, yes, you have to put all the <clears throat> the other things in the, <clears throat> so maybe it's not possible, but it sure is nice on those residential buildings that you see in Manhattan or other cities where you have the possibility of going upstairs and going outside. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll defer to Jonathan on, on that, uh, just as a practical matter, what I can say behind the scenes is if we could Barry would and, and there are a couple of other projects that he's contemplating in in town and in downtown that would have such a feature uh I don't know that this is the right one for it though but I'll I'll defer to Jonathan just about the space on the roof it, it's it's a little tight on the roof um the current uh energy code requires us uh to dedicate on the at least in the new building because it's new construction uh, forty percent of the area to potential uh, future rooftop PV. That's the area that's that kind of medium gray, and then we have our enclosed uh, roof, you know, zone within the the screening for the rooftop equipment. There is some additional space up there, but it it tends to be towards the edge of the roof. Of the, I, I'm I'm not sure that this is the right project for that. Um, I'd be reticent to try to put it on the old roof because i think we would probably trigger structural upgrades but um i i tend to agree with tom i i think um it'd be better in a, in another project okay um i bruce i see your hand but i want to say just to remind the board that this is a predominantly a site plan review um so the interior of the building is you know, it's helpful for us to understand it, but it's not really the area in which we have authority to, you know, suggest changes. Bruce, go ahead. 
Oh, um, well, you'll understand why in a minute, I hope, Doug, but I'm about to go right back to where you uh, have uh, warned us off. If, uh, <laughs> uh, drop down the slide, if you wouldn't mind, uh, Jonathan. So there, um, I was going to say that uh, I think we should make some observation uh, about the uh, the suitability of this for family housing. Uh, and the reason is because we're being asked later to approve uh, a buy uh, um, basically uh, um, uh, an in lieu, uh, a purchase in lieu of provision of affordable units. Um, and and uh, despite what was said earlier, I think there are two, there are two uh, factors here that suggest pretty clearly, at least to my sense of uh, how the world works or would work, that suggests that this is more likely, uh, not inevitably, but more likely to appeal to students and uh, the first observation is that all the bedrooms are the same. Um, in family housing, you very often have, uh, uh, the way we typically, you know, we think we work is you have a, a, a married couple or a couple of some sort who are sharing a room, and then you have kids who frequently don't share rooms. So you look for one of the bedrooms being a little larger uh, than the others. And and the second is the the, the aggregate relation uh, proportion of uh, bedroom space to living space, and the proportion of bedroom space to living space in these units is quite markedly in favour of bedrooms where people can have some degree of individual privacy, and that's uh, given at the expense of living space, which has been uh, diminished to some degree. So uh, I, I'm not uh, saying that this is inappropriate. I'm just observing that this is what's likely. Um, uh, and so uh, I will make the observation uh, or the argument, I think, later on um, to, uh, uh, to, to my board colleagues that insofar as this um, project is not uh, being developed uh, su suitably for, or su for, for family um, housing, and, and it's in a location in town that perhaps makes that not so surprising. I mean, there's not a lot of recreational availability around here for young kids, but there is for older kids. Um, it seems that this is probably not the best place in town for affordable housing. So if that's true, and I'm not, I'm, I'm proposing it as an argument uh, to, to, to be tested later on, I suspect, but insofar as that's true, then uh, the layout that we've got here is is is, is kind of consistent with uh, um, a request from the applicant that they should be that they would be um, seeking to purchase in lieu of providing affordable housing. So that's the only reason why I think we should look inside these, see what we think uh, the uh, likely market is, and make some mm -hmm. judgments later on about whether we think that. Uh, um, making this um, purchase in lieu is appropriate. I may have gotten confused. I may be talking nonsense, but that's at least the moment anyway, the way I'm thinking. Thanks, Bruce. And, and I certainly read the plans the same way. Um, I, I do want to mention that I didn't see, or I don't remember seeing any sort of summary of the actual unit mix in the building, like how many four bedrooms, how many three bedrooms, how many two bedrooms? Uh, is that something, Tom or Jonathan, you have at hand? Yes. Yeah, so it's four one bedroom units, four two bedroom units, five three bedroom units, and nine four bedroom units. Uh, 22 units and 63 beds is the total. So that was four, four, five, and nine. Correct. All right. Thank you. Sure. All right, Jonathan. I'm just trying to remember if, if there was anything else that I wanted Is this to point out. the section out. through the screen yes. we're referring yes. to? Yeah. And we would make that, I mean, I think the backup, the structural part of it would probably be wood, but um, we would clad that uh, in the same sort of metal panel that we're putting on the skin of the building. Um, at some point, we'll have to review that with a, a structural engineer. They they may want us to use a perforated panel, um, but it would still be the same color and, and textures of, of the um, other pieces. There would be a similar piece 
um, which I don't think we've highlighted yet on the existing building. Now, obviously, there's going to be some mechanical equipment on the existing building. Um, but there we also have the benefit of, of you know, the traditional high parapets that uh, a typical 19th century building would have. So we're kind of belt and suspenders there a little bit, but uh, better safe than sorry. Okay. And I think... So we had, so we had worked with a, um, working through Barry uh, and some of his suppliers, we have done a, um, a kind of tentative lighting layout with a tentative um, photometric, uh, which is always a challenge on these calls to kind of read. Could you make that bigger or are we gonna? Yeah, is there anywhere in, so I, I mean, I'll start, um, maybe I'll start at the front and we can, as Jonathan says, walk around the building a little bit. The, uh, the you know, those zeros are a little right there, a little disingenuous because they didn't, they did not, you know, do the photometrics on the existing fixtures. Uh, and obviously there's also a street, a couple street lights right there. But, you know, from there, from the, the person who ran the, the computer software, it's zero because they didn't input anything. But there are downcast uh, gooseneck lights yes. along the front as they exist today and that's what's proposed when amherst college goes in front of the drb and so you know when we're close to the street these are the light levels that the lighting we're installing uh would cast and doesn't count necessarily the issues of light that 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 street light would have but we have a row of bollards um i think they call them the the mh fixture here to kind of line that the entry path. Uh, we have some uh, recessed cans underneath our canopy. Um, I believe so there's some step lights. Um, I, I'm pretty sure we had a, another light kind of on the back side of that sign to kind of illuminate the, the side of the, the ramp there as well. Yeah, I'm just not seeing the fixture number for some reason. And then continuing kind of up that arcade, uh, there's a, some additional can um, fixtures that illuminate the arcade and, and the, the roof over the, the parking spots. Mm -hmm. And then as we move a little further west and then north, uh, there's kind of a wall or yeah, building mounted uh, light fixture above each of the, the doors. So of that uh, trash room service door, a couple here at the corners uh, where aren't, there aren't doors, but it would be otherwise a very dark little corner between the various buildings. And then one at the egress point there. Jonathan, is the trash door, is the trash exiting the building on the west side or on the south side? On the west side. If we can, we can move back to that plan if you want to see it in the more detailed view. Um, but it would be kind of in that um, space, that's that sidewalk space. And your trash hauler is okay with that? That seems kind yep. of con convoluted. As it's a little as... convoluted, but it, you know, th there was there was some concern about you know, whether we didn't want to mark, <laughs> ding up vehicles that might be parked in the, in the, in the parking place or assume that they're not going to be there at the time the trash needs to go out. Um, and so it was felt that the best decision was to simply take it out of the building directly and bring it around. It's going to be in kind of rolling um, bins as it is, you know, you, you're not going to get the big, um, the, the, you know, there's not going to be room for a dumpster, so they're going to have to be in rolling bins, unfortunately. And the uh, toters will stay inside the trash room until the trash until truck the arrives, of, or they will correct. come out beforehand. I don't know, Tom, if you want to talk a little bit to the management plan, but that's that's as I understand it. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll ask Barry. He, I know he does this on U Drive South, so that has an in. If you're familiar, that's the um, three story building across from Ginger Garden, corner of University Drive South and Route Nine. There's a trash room there and they get rolled out um, for the USA waste to, to pick up. Oh, it's the night before or the morning of. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, Janet, I see your hand. So a question I forgot to raise, which I think is um, for a Lebanese Pleasant was how do people pull up a moving van and unload or you know, their minivan or whatever. And especially if people are moving in on probably the same day or the same few days um, without like blocking 
access other people's access to this little road here um is there scheduling want... scheduling just setting up blocks of time when folks are able to actually unload their vehicles uh and i can't i don't know how it would be done like you know first floor second floor or if it's a little bit between and amongst but that's how it's done is that there's a schedule that uh, each tenant would get when they would have the ability to get in, get their stuff out, and then move out of the way to allow another tenant to move in. But where would the trucks sit is my question. Would they? I would drive, suspect. In the drive, yeah. Probably isn't, in here. Isn't that a road? No. It, it is a right of way, right. but it is part of the property of this project. But it, it's a right away for the, everybody behind it, right? And the buildings behind it. So yes, okay. but I think they have alternative access. If I go to the to the aerial, yep, there you go. Right. So you there's another way to get around from this, you know, the Brody building, so called. Like they could come out this way, so they wouldn't be pinned in if there was a vehicle that was parked in I, that access. I assume, Tom, I assume that the Brody building has easement rights to the 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 drive in your property. They do. That's correct. So, it would be something that you would need to probably coordinate or at least as a courtesy let them know, you know, on September 1st we're going to be blocking with our tenant unloading and uh you'll need to make your one way on the south side of the Brody building two way or something. Precisely. Yes. And uh, in, in your experience, is the fire department okay with that kind of event? I think we would be coordinating with them as well, but I, I think they'd be okay with it. Barry's had conversations with uh, uh, Chris Bascom uh, at the fire department, just about this site generally, mm -hmm. and they were okay with it. Okay. Well, we did have comments from the fire department in our packet. So uh, perhaps we could put that in the management plan. But so in terms of the um the other little the the other way the other way in and out of the Brody building, I had a memory that it was one way. Is that a one way or two way egress? My experience is that it's been one way going in on the north side and coming around and then out on the south side. So yeah. That would need to be, you know temporarily marked otherwise uh, if they were blocking the space. I suppose it's possible, is it not Tom to, or even Chris to request to block off a couple of parking spaces on South Pleasant Street for it? You know, mm -hmm. you, can, you can make that request to town yeah. hall and reserve a couple of spaces for, for your use. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right, Jonathan, we've continued to interrupt you, but go ahead. That's all right. I think I think we were at the end of what I'm going to call the architectural package. Um, right. I'm so glad I, to entertain I, questions, but I think then there's there is we do have a, a short site package due, more formal yeah. site package. Well, um, before you leave and we go to well, the site go package, I'm going to ask you a question about something that the site package showed. The site package showed a prefabricated concrete stair mm. with, with a what looked like a non, uh, or it's a precast concrete step assembly, and it had a railing shown that was not ex an ADA compliant or MAAB compliant. And I just wasn't sure where that particular piece would show up. I, I know where that is. On and, sheet nine. Yep. Yeah. That that is actually right near our front door. Um, you know, the ramp comes up one side, and well, I don't know. I don't. That's not that though. I I think I, I not to speak for a site designer. I think that may be a kind of standard detail that that just it's landed just, on this sheet. That used. doesn't correspond oh. to our stairs. Okay. All right. I, I will say there, you know, we need to do some coordination with the site designer on, on who, which one of us actually has the final details on the on the ramp uh, and and stair railings. Um, but I, I expect they'll probably be in the architectural. Right. Package. Yeah, I guess I, I'm uh, I suppose one question I could ask uh, Mr. Roberts is um, 
Oh, actually, never mind. I, I don't. I'll, I'll then I'll just say, um, you know, sort of what level of design quality are you striving for in this forecourt and the sort of pedestrian experience approaching the building? Is it is it pretty low low end? Uh, you know, uh, something like that prefabricated precast stair, or is it more, you know, crafted? I think we're looking for something that's more crafted. I, I will certainly defer to Barry and and the finances that come along with the project, but I, I, the intent is not to have a a precast mm -hmm. stair. Um, you know what we presented to the DRB is that the retaining walls around the the planters would be stone of some sort. Um, I'm showing sort of a granite, but you know the the, the final construction details are not done on that that uh -huh. portion of it. All right. Well, I think. Um... You know, you showed us some of the materials for the building. Um, do you have any, are you at the point of having materials for this forecourt? Well, I think we could pr probably present some more. Um, our intent is to, as I say, do it out of stone, mm -hmm. um, but I don't well, know I'm that thinking, we have final you know, materials selected yet. The, the railing and, the, and yeah. the site walls and, you know, how, what are what kind of materials are you using for that? Yeah. You know, you know, is the ramp an asphalt ramp or is no, it, no, let's let's is actually it concrete, we went back past it too quickly. Stone. Yeah, let's let's go back to the architectural package, Tom, if we could. Now the intent is to do um oh, oh, wait, I'll I'll let it come up. Well, that's not it. <laughs> Life's a beach. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, so if we scroll down to, I think it's A8, we have that that kind of blow up view. I, I must have moved, I must have clearly moved too fast through that. Um, so our intent is to, to do stone kind of edging to the planting beds, um, precast uh, concrete pavers, uh, for the kind of walkway surfaces that are the ramp. Um, and then obviously the, the sidewalk, the repairs to the sidewalk that are on the street will be in concrete. Um, the sidewalk along the south side is intended to be cast in place concrete. Um, we have a, a wooden bench uh, and a, and a uh, bike rack along that south edge. Uh, and then if I didn't touch it before, we've got the, the uh, evergreen plantings around the uh, transformer, some more seasonal kind of uh, ornamental grasses that'll make up the, the rest of that block, plus a, a, a tree that would have a higher canopy that so we can see underneath it. Um, then at the front of the site, we have a kind of a mixture of perennials and annuals, something that they'll have color during the, the warmer seasons of the of the year. Um, okay. the, the intent with that canopy, the canopy is going to be a metal, metal framed canopy. Um, and similarly, we would do metal handrails uh, for the ramps and, and stairs. And there's lighting under that canopy? Yes, yeah. They'd okay. be re I think they'd be recessed. Maybe we'd do a surface, but the moment we're looking at a recessed. All right. Uh, Chris, I see your hand. Yeah, I just wanted to say, and I think Jonathan said this already, that um, there needs to be a coordination between the civil um, drawings and the architectural drawings because there are differences and I think the the walls that in that encase these um, planting areas are labeled concrete walls on the civil drawings so if you intend something else they should be labeled appropriately on these drawings so there's just some coordination that needs to happen that hasn't happened yet thank you all right um so Jonathan I guess one one more question I yep I do see the list of recommendations from the design review board. And I wondered whether any of what we're seeing incorporates those comments or how, how in fact you've responded to them. Yep. So we, we have uh, explored a number of the things they looked at or they, they suggested some of them when we looked at it, we didn't necessarily agree with them. Um, uh, for example, they suggested painting or using a yellow brick at the base of the uh, new building. We we really like the contrast um, of the red brick versus the yellow brick, and and like tying in the color of the the brick at the base to the tower. Um, 
And while I have your notes up on my other screen here, I don't know that I I opened the the DRB's comments. I mean, I could I could read them for yeah, you. Yeah, if you would would be so kind. All right. So the first one, the applicant should consider a method to make the elevator shaft feel less independent, whether it be through color scheme or blending of materials. Yeah. So if we go back to the the, the earlier three D views that show the whole building, that's one. Honestly, as the design team, we 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 don't necessarily agree with. We like the the the, the architectural separation that the tower has as a separate color and a, and a slightly taller form. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know that there was necessarily unanimity on the part of the, the DRB on that topic. Okay. Um, second item, consider incorporating more outdoor lighting into the arcade area. And I think I think we've responded to that. I don't know that we had that that photometric or or the lighting plan at the time that that they reviewed okay. it. All right. Um, in fact, I'm sure we did. I guess, Karen, I know you're on the DRB, and I see your hand. Do you want to say something before I go through the rest of these? Yeah, I, I was at that meeting, and uh, you're right, Jonathan. There was not unanimity about that. I I personally. Um, I'm on that board and I, I agree with you. I like the separation too. But I wanted to say um, this arcade coming in, um, I don't know, it looks different to me than on the other pictures that I said. Have you considered having that, uh, that, that brick thing in the front is just a sign? Is there any reason for that to block it off? I mean, it seems like you could make that whole thing accessible from the street and, and kind of open it up as a, a place for people to meet. Uh, Unfortunately, and we may still have a stepped connector there where we're still going back and forth a little bit with the with the site designer on that. But unfortunately, the cross slopes, if we brought the ramp straight down into the sidewalk at the street, the, the cross slopes don't meet accessibility um, guidelines, unfortunately. So you need uh, the longer run. We need the longer run and to meet up the, at a leveler spot on the sidewalk. I see. The the sidewalk at the end of that that ramp, if it came out straight, not only is it is it it's a little steep in the north south direction, but it also pitches in the east west direction, and so it, it it's a, a rather warped plane. Okay, Janet. So I, I agree with Karen on the, I don't, that wall with the number on it just seems, you know, it, it's, it, you know, I first saw this plan, I thought, oh, this is great. Here's this place that, you know, kind of invites you in and that, that brick wall just says, don't come here. And then behind it is this kind of wall of kind of boring grasses. And I, I thought it's sort of, to me, it's sort of a missed opportunity to sort of tie in the street, people passing by, and the people who live there. And I wonder if it could be more of a plaza. And I, I don't suggest, you know, getting rid of the ramp, because obviously it's important, but I would get rid of the wall and kind of the tedious, what I would think of as almost corporate plantings of grasses and the same evergreens and make it more of a garden, maybe with more seating for people in the building or somebody who's going to come up with a cup of coffee and maybe talk to someone like that wall um, just makes it, it's, it's, it kind of pushes the interaction away from the street, if that makes any sense. So I just wondered if you could make that plaza more of a nice community meeting spot or a place where the tenants can sort of sit. I love the idea of perennials and, and different ones. And I just think there's different grasses and I forget the grasses. I hate grasses, but different shrubs that, you know, bloom at different times or just kind of a nice garden. There's some really pretty gardens in downtown Amherst. The one by Share Coffee is beautiful. The one by First Church is amazing. It'd be great to do something a little more exciting and something that invites people in to the community, you know, to tie it into the community more. All right, thanks, Janet. If I could weigh in here quickly, <clears throat> one thing that is different from what the design review board saw was that the, the, the ramp under the arcade connected out with the street uh, and this is a change that was made, I think, when when uh, dealing with uh, the civil engineering and, and grading part of it. I, I still think we need to make that ramp connect to the street, or maybe there's a couple steps there. But the fact, I, I like that uh, that brick wall and that sign, but the fact that that 
that you have to come down and make a right hand turn to get out to the street is, is just doesn't work. So I think that's something that will be modified um, hopefully soon as this gets as the design gets developed. All right. Um, you know, I could imagine moving that wall to the back side of the ramp. Um, just to throw that out so. as you think about it further. Bruce. The, the other thing we could explore is is um, you know the, the, our property line actually isn't at the face of the Hastings building. You know we we could enlarge the size of that that planting bed towards the street by two or three feet and still be on the the project's property. And you know maybe you develop that as as a little bit deeper of a planting area. Maybe you can develop it into a bench as well or a seating opportunity. Yeah, I I feel like. You know, if you're sitting on the bench you've got now, you're looking at the blank wall of the Brody building. And, you know, despite, I guess, Janet hoping that we draw the public in there and maybe have more benches, I think we need some benches out at the street where you actually get some sun and you've got some people walking by to, to look at. So, I mean, I, I think that would be worth considering. All right, uh, we have two, two hands up, Bruce first and then Karen. Um, well, I was, uh, well, first of all, I, I would say about this whole entry and, and the, the way in which uh, uh, it's designed, the existing building, the, uh, the graceful kind of uh, um, human scale uh, development of this uh, Southeast corner that goes through uh, to the, uh, the building, uh, the new building at the back, I, I agree with you, Jonathan and Karen, I think the red uh, tower is fine and it would be uh, sad to uh, comply with that element of the DRB that wants it to somehow be muted. Um, I like the whole way in which this uh, th this um, uh, works and, 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 and uh, uh, is offered. But as we get down to the the, 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 the the very small scale right at the street, I agree with you, Doug. I think that um, uh, we could do better. I, I think that having the seating over there, now it's nice that the, uh, the rendering shows the sun at, I'm going to guess, uh, 9 a.m. <laughs> um, and uh, if... Uh, the seating and the seating now is quite nice as far as the sun is concerned, but it does offer the blank wall and there's not much people. If the if the seating could be put uh, in the uh, area uh, against the street where you've got mm -hmm. the uh, grasses and so forth, I did a little sketch that uh, it's, it's I'm I'm not terribly proud of it because I, I did it just to make a point and it may not be necessary to show it because I think the concept is fairly easy to understand. But it does seem to me that the place to put seating that would be a real uh, benefit to the public, um, uh, it would be a nice gesture, a nice public gesture to put seating uh, uh, along some of the length of that uh, uh, grassed area that's right against the street. Yes, there. You could move the wall if you wanted to have a pillar at the end with 55 on it, or you could do as... Uh, I think um, Doug just said you could push it to the back side of the ramp rather than the front side. But if uh, seating was offered here in some portion of that, uh, it might be uh, half of it or it might be two thirds of it, but certainly to the northern end of it. Um, I think then as the sun came around to 11 o'clock and noon, you would be you would you would you would still get the, the last vestige of sun would be shining in that area on that seating. The Southeast is a really golden quadrant because that's the that's where the warm morning sun comes. And it really is a lovely way to sit because you are sheltered from the North and the West winds in this location. You've got the morning sun, you've got people walking by, you've got the common. It just seems to be a place that is begging to have a, se a, a seat so that someone can enjoy everything that's on offer there uh, at certain times of the year. So I would, um, ask whether that has been thought about or whether it might be thought about or, or, and, and whether that's uh, uh, whether that's not such a good idea or that I've been uh, uh, mentioning and I guess I'm kind of advocating for it as well. Um, there may be good reasons why that's a bad idea, but I don't see them at the moment and I would uh, like to know if there 
if it's not a great idea, because I think this really nice design that you've got here that that, that brings people off the street and into this building, um, gracefully integrates the two buildings, manages a lot of things very well, I think. I think it could be made just a little bit more perfect by making this public offering uh, in a sunny, sheltered spot with uh, plenty of opportunity to look at people as you're sitting down, uh, perhaps having your uh, Vera Cruzana or whatever is in that uh, shop next door. I hope well, that's considered a, a, <laughs> an attraction for undesirables uh, because uh, I would love to see that I uh, could think of sitting there at some point. As you know, I used to work for three or four or five or years above that, right above three stories above that corner. And, and I'm quite familiar with this part of the world and, and particularly this corner because my office was in exactly this location, but uh, but but 25 feet above it. And I, I know what uh, the morning sun feels like from that quadrant. Well, right. Bruce, when when uh, Tom and I were talking this morning about the uh, about the review and the, and the development report that we were we were getting to talk about just that. Um, I, I think we we'd be certainly open to looking at, at you know further development on that certainly in that front piece um and i'm not going to dismiss any of the other ideas uh, that fo folks have put out about you know, other aspects of this we're we're still very much open to to making this this kind of um yeah, I, I don't quite call it a pocket garden because it's not quite big enough to beat that um but or a pocket park i should say um but you know i think that you're right this has the potential for being a great amenity not just for the project but for for this in a little slice of the town center and so we're we'd be glad to continue to to, to explore some ideas here yeah i think right. these are all really good points and this needs more development um and i'm repeating myself but i think it's really important to to uh, connect the arcade directly to the street and not there still may be need to be a ramp there but i still need there needs to be a connection directly to the street not have a planting bed in the way uh, all right. i'm all right. i would argue with you on that john but uh we we got plenty of time to do that, and and I'm just on the board here, and I I don't usually want to uh, advocate for architectural solutions. That's not why I'm here, but this just seems to be such a perfect opportunity, and and you know I'm I've uh, I've I've spent a lot of time, uh, just as uh, Johanna has, we, we uh, living in this place here, uh, in recent years. Anyway, that's my piece. I'll shut up. Thank you, Bruce. All right, we've got uh, another hand up from Karen, and then I see one hand from someone in the public that uh, we need to get to at some point. And I also see that we are approaching eight o'clock when we often take a uh, break for a few minutes. So board members think about whether we're far enough through this that you wanna continue it after a break. So Karen, go ahead. Yeah, very short. I think uh, you've you've chimed in with exactly what I think. This is for me one of the most important features of adding this whole complex is getting this arcade right. And I think there should be a lot of brainstorming how to get as much seating and make this a cozy, really inviting, beautiful place. Um, and I think you got the message. And, and and look at it from all sides. Getting rid of that. Uh, making seating in the front, making a lot of seating. Um, yeah, just hope I'm, I'm really looking forward to different solutions here. Thanks. All right. I guess I will, I will just chime in that I'm, I'm not thinking about making it so inviting as to making it a sort of delightful thing that I observe as I walk by. Mm. Uh, Janet. My quick time was I was thinking of it in both ways in, in, you know, connecting the people who live in the building with the community and like that would be a great place to come out and have some coffee and sit in the sun and sit in some, you know, look at some flowers and see people go by or maybe talk to them. And so I was thinking more of a plaza kind of thing for the people who live there and also, you know, for, you know, people walking by. So. All right. Um, let's see, Karen, your hand is still up. Do you have anything else? All right, and Janet, I'm gonna drop your hand too. All right, um, why don't, uh, Pam, why don't we call the one person, uh, Johanna, go ahead. 
This question has been sitting in the back of my mind and I was trying to figure out whether to ask it or not. So Doug, if you want to put the kibosh on it, by all means do. But to me, this seems like just an absolute prime location in town. And I understand, I, I don't know enough about how you decide what is market rate, but why is there not a million dollar penthouse, like luxury cash cow apartment in the top of this thing that would bring in tons of revenue for the town? <laughs> well, uh, I guess uh, you'd have to ask Barry Roberts that, I think. <laughs> Part of that is we can't go to six stories. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. First of all, I think Jonathan, that's a great point. Let us go higher. But um, this project is going to be rental. Their preview of coming attractions, and Jonathan, I think knows where I'm going with this. There's a a project that Kuhn Riddle and Barry have been working on that is a downtown space that is going to be proposed as condominium units. So this just isn't, I could go into all the factors why, but I think I'll just suffice to say that, you know, fingers on the pulse of what could be, and it's uh, 37 North Pleasant Street is the is the site for it. And Kuhn Riddle has done a really nice job with some plans, uh, parking underneath, uh, commercial at the front, and then, you know, four stories of residential, really nice apartment units, you know, figuring out is there a rooftop space, is there you know, first floor, second floor space. So yeah, I mean, again, really thinking about it, this just doesn't, this just isn't the one. Okay. I suspect, um, you know, to some degree, the fact that you don't want to put another story on the, on the Hastings building is also part of it. Right. But there's a pretty substantial financial penalty for having to reinforce that structure. That, that, that would require us to, you know, basically do a gut re reconstruction of that building and there's actually on the upper floors a lot of still original woodwork you mm -hmm. know window moldings and, and that sort of thing that that you know we we as architects want to preserve and i know barry as as a building owner building manager um would want to preserve as well okay all right um I don't see any more board hands so why don't we go and do a couple of public comment hands uh, Pam, if you could bring the person with the phone number over to let them comment. Uh, and uh, why don't we see? Eddie? Hello. Hello, uh, welcome to our, bo our board meeting and um, please give us your name and your street address. You have three minutes. Oh. Hello? He's muted. Uh, can you unmute yourself? I believe you can press um, star nine. Door nine allows him to raise his hand, but I'm not sure how he gets unmuted. Not sure either. I, yeah, Pam, I can hear you, but I can't hear the. Hi. Hello. All right, um, Pam, why don't we bring in the next person and and give this person a few minutes to think about how to okay. how to unmute themselves. Hi, All Pam. Right. Pam Rooney, uh, welcome, and give us your name and your street address. Hi, Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. Uh, this has been a great presentation. I'm looking forward to seeing this work done. I had a couple of nitty gritty questions, and one has to do with the operation of the um, bookstore, there doesn't seem to be any clear route from the bookstore to the trash room at the back of the building. And that probably wants to be fairly seamless to make it easy for uh, Amherst College to function smoothly. Um, secondly, I will, I will add my voice to the conversation about seating at the front of the building along, along South Pleasant Street. I think 
as everyone has said, it is a wonderful opportunity um, to have some viewing, to sit and, and watch, to sit and engage, and to have a place for those Amherst College families who are going to spend lots of money in the store, uh, just hang out while they're waiting for something else to be happening. Um, I think it will add to the conviviality of, of activities on South Pleasant Street, um, which of course we want to enhance. Um, I'll just leave it at that, but I think, I think that that front area um, could could go a lot farther. Uh, so in incorporation of some seating into that area that is shown as flower bed. Um, I would I would discourage anyone from thinking about encroaching further into the walkway uh, along South Pleasant Street. I think that's a an important um, activity zone for pedestrians. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Pam. Uh, next, let's bring Letitia LaFollette back. And Letitia, we can now take your comment. Hello, Letitia, please unmute yourself. I did now, fine. Can you hear me? Yes, great. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Letitia LaFollette, 18 Dana Street. Um, this was a great presentation and really good discussion of the entrance arcade. I strongly support the project for three reasons. The first is that it's um, going to create 22 new residential units in the center of town, um, along with uh, obviously uh, maintaining the Hastings building um, and making it actually even more attractive. Um, Amherst needs both the housing and that commercial space. The second reason that's especially important to me is the nearly $400,000 in annual yearly tax revenue that the project is estimated to bring Amherst. The town needs this kind of revenue. For far too long, Amherst has relied on residential property taxes to pay for its budget. Um, we need to diversify the revenue sources of the town and development like this one is an important way to do so. And finally, um, something that hasn't really been discussed much is the proposal Mr. Roberts has made to pay over a million dollars to the Affordable Housing Trust. I think this is a visionary idea. Doing this instead of creating three affordable units in this complex, which is problematic for several reasons, um, I think the additional money, um, the AHT funds, could be used to help with home ownership over apartment rentals, which is something I think many of us want to encourage. So for these three reasons, as well as the very positive reviews the project has received from the Design Review Board, I would urge the planning board to move ahead on this proposal. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Letitia. And thanks for waiting to deliver your comments. Um, Pam Rooney, I assume your hand is no longer needed and that you don't have a second comment to make, but uh, well, I'll go to Kent and Pam, if your hand is still up, then uh, we'll come back to you. Kent Farber, let's, let's bring Kent over. Kent, please give us your name and your street address. Yes, Kent Ferber, 481 Station Road, District 5. And thank you for the opportunity to comment. This has been a very interesting and thorough presentation. And I basically want to second Letitia's comments, particularly concerning the way projects like this will help with pretty severe financial problems being encountered by the town right now financial problems which end up because revenues don't match expenses by such a large portion, which end up pitting one segment of the town, one group of interests against another, and just exacerbating the kind of uh, divides that characterize Amherst and our society today. I also strongly support the payment in lieu of uh, the, the uh, affordable housing units because it will give the housing trust the flexibility to solve the affordable housing problem in a way that they're much more capable of uh, figuring out than we are, and it gives them the flexibility to do that. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak, and I hope you'll support this project. All right, thank you, Kent. All right, I don't see any more hands from the public, and I don't, oh. Okay, and um, none from the board at the moment. 
um, board members, do you do you want to continue this uh, conversation this evening? Uh, Jonathan, is there more material you want us to go through? Did you want to go through the civil drawings in more detail? Um, I, I, you know, I know there were some questions in the development report about the uh, the uh, stormwater management. And, um, you know, we, we could spend the time tonight to go through that and, and through the rest of the design review board comments. Um, but it, it seems like we've already, we've, we've already gotten to a point where you're saying, hey, we need to think about that some more and maybe sure. we'll, you'll be coming back anyway. And for, if I could, Mr. Chair, I think for what it's worth, um, with our engineer here tonight, why don't we get into the site plan just to talk about drainage and see if there are any you know, real concerns, if any modifications need to be made, because what I've heard so far is, you know, go back, particularly really look at that front entrance seating, et cetera, which is really more of an architectural piece of it, obviously site plan component, so that ideally we come back on March 20th and, you know, uh, with all due respect to Phil Henry, maybe we can give him the night off. So, okay. all right. So in that case, um, uh, Bruce, I see your hand. Uh, I am going to suggest maybe after Bruce makes a comment that we take a break and uh, for five minutes, and then we'll come back and go through the civil drawings. Bruce. I was just going to observe that we did have a site visit on this and we uh, haven't uh, uh, mentioned that. I mean, we we typically have a short report from those. Right, I, I I lost track of that. So why don't we start? Why don't we start on that when we come back from our break? Sure. I thought you might want to do that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The time now on my clock is eight eleven. Five minutes from now is eight sixteen. Please uh, turn off your cameras and mute your microphones and come on back and turn on your camera at least at eight sixteen. Thank you.
All right, I looks like it's 816. And uh, if you are lurking in behind a camera that's turned off, please turn it on. Doug, I'm back. I'm just getting situated. It's Johanna. All right. Thank you, Johanna. All right. Tom, are you comfortable going forward at this point? Uh, I see Barry and Jonathan still have their cameras off. I'm not sure whether they're back. Yeah, they're. I know Barry's back. Um, OK. And Jonathan, I'll trust that he's back. But we'll, we can turn it over to Phil to, there he is. OK, great. We'll turn it over to Phil. Uh, I'm going to put the, uh, I'm going to share my screen I'm just going to put up the grading plan. If and if there are, uh, until can say this well, himself. I, but if there, I are... mean, okay. Well, so before we, before you do that, let's do the site visit report. Sure. Um, and Bruce and I'm not sure who else attended. Uh, is there is there anyone that wants to be the spokesperson, or do you want to just start, Bruce? I could do that. Um, I mean, I think that at this point, it's important just so that the record shows that. Uh, that the four of the planning, uh, the planning board didn't uh, conduct this hearing without anyone having actually ever been there. Um, the four of us did: Janet, uh, um, Karen, um, Karen, uh, uh, Fred, who's not here for some reason. I hope that everything's okay in in the life of Fred and myself. Um, uh, so we 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 toured the outside of the building. We didn't go inside. Uh, we walked around. We had Jonathan uh, and Barry were there. Um, uh, Jonathan, you were there, weren't you? Yes. Uh, no, it was me. It was uh, me, Bruce. Oh, don't insult Jonathan like that. Oh, golly, yes, it's true. You, he, Jonathan, you had more hair. So, um, <laughs> and uh, but Barry was there, and uh, and and so was Chris. Um, we we did uh, um, uh. Notice, you know, the extent of the building and so forth, and and so we stood where the corners were. It really is uh, a great increase in in the coverage of actual building. The site coverage is going down, but the building coverage is obviously going way up. Um, uh, the we we did look as as we'll mention in a minute. These is a there's a there's a drainage proposal that basically has a, a good portion of the drainage wrapping around the west, uh, the northwest, and then the, the south side of the building um, as best we could stand and see the. The grade was pretty solid, and the water would run pretty quickly um, uh, around that very long uh, trajectory. We can talk some, but we did see that, and we discussed it. Um, we noted the the, the, the pressure treated wood retaining wall that was staying, and why, and the trees that were there. And Barry, I think, decided that moving the wall would basically mean the trees would go away. I think he thought that he could deal that the trees were worth keeping and could be kept. Um, and so they will be kept. Uh, and the only thing that I'll add, uh, and then Karen um, or Janet can uh, say something if they choose, uh, I suppose. Um, but what hasn't been mentioned yet, but was very, very evident when you were walking around the building was that the, the space on the north side of the building, which leads around and into the uh, plaza behind or alongside the cinema center which opens out into the uh the the um the the the, the, 
whatever the name of that restaurant is now, um, that um, alleyway is going to be substantially increased in width. It's about uh, four feet, if that, at the moment, it's probably going to be closer to 14 feet. So a really substantial increase in the, uh, uh, and if you looked on the, the, the lighting plan, you'd see that the, the lighting levels are really quite uh, substantial. I think it'll feel very safe uh, around there. Um, and you might tell us, Jonathan, whether those lights are on any kind of control that's going to keep them on all night or whether they have to be shut off. But it seems that there might be a case if, if the, uh, the the more the longer they're on, probably the better for the town, I think. Anyway, we, we noted all of that. Um, and uh, um, I don't know whether others would add anything I've forgotten. Karen? Uh, <clears throat> no, but I'm... I'm hoping that that alleyway evolves into a, a nice uh, sort of an outdoor space behind the Bank of America. I, I keep mentioning that. Um, I, I, I like the fact that it's getting big, bigger and that it's going to be a safe place to be outside. Okay. And Janet, I assume you don't want to add anything? I, I don't have anything to add. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right, thanks, Bruce. Uh, and Tom will we'll resume your presentation. And thanks for waiting. Perfect. Uh, and maybe to answer one of Bruce's questions, the, the lights will be uh, dusk to dawn. So that's the idea with those lights, those wall packs on the north and westerly side is that they would get on at dusk and then come off at, at dawn. So they'd be on timers that way. I think that's a generous uh, offering on the part of the owner. Uh, others may, but anyway, we'll see. But it's, I think they are lights that will be, that there will be betterment if they're on. So what I'll do, let me, you know, I'm going to start with um, the demolition and erosion, erosion control plan just to kind of highlight what Bruce had said. So you'll see in this gray that I'm hovering over right now, that's the existing L of the building. And you see to the north of it is the Amherst Cinema Building. And so this is, you know, for those on the site walk, this is where we had walked and we stopped about, you know, right here where we had a little bit more breathing room, you know, to the north, this is that uh, area behind, you know, Bank of America's over here, some Bank of America parking is right here. And you'll see where this black, dashed line is that's the extent of the new building and so you'll see and i think you're right bruce and i'll flip down to it in a minute when we're going to turn over to phil but i think it's about 14 feet from building to building in this area and it's certainly you know 10 feet at least from the property line so you can see where it is currently and then where it's going to go and what that dimension is going to look like uh, especially in relation to what's there now hey tom Yes. Before you leave that, I'm, uh, something just popped into my head. Um, and maybe this is a question more for Jonathan or even, even John Kuhn. You've been so respectful of the setbacks, of the 10 foot setbacks, uh, you know, which, which on the one hand, I appreciate, you know, it's fewer ver uh, waivers or variances or permits, but um, could the project be substantially better in some way if you shifted it farther north or you know went farther west or you know did were those constraints that have been obstacles or did everything really go smoothly no you know at times we we were struggling against that 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 10 foot boundary but you know it's there's a there's building code um constraints that come as well as you get closer to a property line and the 10 feet really worked out to be a, a good balance point um, between you know not having to do not having to reduce the amount of glazing for example um, that would happen as you get closer to the property line uh -huh. um, and so you know would it be nice to have a few more you know another foot or two inside the building yes but I think it's a reasonable trade-off um I'd rather have bigger windows than say another six inches in, in, in the length of a room or something like that. So um, we did certainly look at it. We, you know, uh, <laughs> we spent a lot of time saying, well, what if we do this? What if we do that? But it, it really was in the end, the best balance point. 
Okay. Uh, I'll, add, I'll add to that. On the south side, you really can't go further because that's a, a right of way, and that's uh, that's where your your vehicular access comes in. Right. On the north side, if you go closer, you're up against the the backside of the cinema building, so there's really got to be some airspace between there, especially on the lower floors. They're going to be looking at a at a wall as it is, so keeping that back certainly makes sense. And on the west side. The existing retaining wall, as you can see there, is already several feet over the property line. So that's not a 10 foot. That's not going to feel like 10 feet back there. It's probably going to feel more like six or seven feet unless that wall is moved. So it seemed like this was the right balance for, uh, for, for all those reasons. OK, thank you. Go ahead, Tom. Thanks. Uh, so I'll, I'll bring up the, the rating and drainage plan. Um, and I'll turn it over to Phil just to talk through just treatment of water on the site. Thanks, Tom. Uh, for the record, my name is Phil Henry with Civil Design Group. Um, we were the civil engineers on this project. I, I think a lot of what I'm what I would talk about is has already been discussed, as it's quite obvious. Um, the the proposed condition as compared to the existing condition, obviously, we have a lot more building which equals uh, cleaner runoff because a, a rooftop is considered clean runoff and it's captured um, via a, a drain pipe that's directly connected into the catch basin. Um, so in the proposed condition, there's a, lo a lot less of what I'll call surface runoff, runoff that is um, traveling via sheet flow or concentrated flow uh, on, on the ground. However, with that being said, I think uh, one member had indicated that, um, I don't know if I could draw on this. Um, well, I'll try to um, direct the, uh, yeah, I'll direct Tom. There's there's flow arrows or little arrows that are shown on the grading plan. So where, where Tom's hand is on the north side, um, water does traverse uh, a, around via in a westerly direction on the north side. And then basically is conveyed along in, in a southerly direction on the westerly side. And then as you get around to the ADA parking space, it, travel, it travels easterly uh, along the southerly side of the building and then eventually makes its way in, into that catch basin via some regrading re of, the, of the driveway. Um, well, you know, somebody can make an argument as to, to add upstream infrastructure. The way we looked at it is if you would look at, um, I understand this is an urban development, but it's akin to, say, for instance, um, if you look at subdivision regs, which in uh, maybe in this town or some other towns, uh, catch basins are to be placed at every 300 feet on 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 roadways. And this this the lineal footage uh, from catch basin traversing around the building along the north side is about 300 feet, and it's on average we'll call it a 12 foot width, which is basically half the half the half the width of a of a typical crowned 24 foot roadway. So while while the while water has to travel um, a, a serpentine distance, um, you know it's it's not a significant watershed. There is a catch basin just to the north of the project that is on the cinema parcel that will take any offsite water. Uh, but um, you know that that's that's the that's the that was the thinking behind not adding in, a, any infrastructure was the fact that this is. The watershed contributing to that catch basin was is really no larger than, uh, say, a, a typical subdivision road. Although, be it, we understand that this is not a subdivision road, so um, I'm happy to take any specific questions as it relates to that. Okay. Uh, my actually, my first question is uh, for Chris. Um, first of all, I assume the Conservation Commission does not need to look at this project. But uh, have you solicited any comments from the town engineer? We have solicited comments, but we haven't received any. And so I think I would recommend to um, Tom Reedy and maybe um, Barry Roberts to get in touch with the town engineer and um, prompt him to send the planning board a note saying that he's looked at these plans and that they are sufficient or give us comments on them because I think uh, sometimes when the applicant prompts the town engineer, he responds better than when we do. 
We can certainly do that. Okay. All right. And then, um, you know, I, I guess one scenario that comes to mind is, you know, if it happens to be raining heavily on September 1st, when all your tenants are parked in the drive and they're trying to walk into the building, you know, having that sheet flow coming around the corner of the building, you know, is going to make for a whole lot of really wet feet. Um, you know, and I can imagine just not finding that very pleasant to have to walk in and out of the building when that's happening. So it may be okay, but it, but it could be kind of unpleasant. Um, Janet. I have a question um, for Ms. Mr. Henry and also for the town engineer is, you know, we're all going to, the, the, all the predictions are we're going to see more water and more rain and, you know, more extreme rains. And we're always dealing with the building code um, that's based on the past. And so my concern is, are these, you know, are the catch basins big enough to hold water? Can we process it? What happens if we have a real, you know, an extreme rain and where does the water go? And it, does it just go on to North Pleasant Street, you know, and is there just an argument for saying let's put an extra one in for those events, or are we are we not making them big enough now because the code hasn't got caught up to the reality that we're seeing? And so, I I, I you know I, I I've heard people raise this issue over and over, and I know we even when we did the the FEMA maps, we're always looking at the past and not looking in the future, which makes sense, but it's making less and less sense not to consider, you know you know, how many hundred year rains have we had in the last 20 years, you know? Um, so I would just wonder is, are people starting to think, let's just make them bigger or put some extras in just for some insurance? All right, uh, Mr. Henry, do you have any any comment about our response to that or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I guess what I would say is we're we're governed by by the regulations at which an applicant or an application is is submitted. I will tell you that this these storm this stormwater analysis and the stormwater report, uh, the HydroCAD is based on the NRCC um, Northeast Atlas uh, stormwater requirement or, or or rainfall data. So the for instance the the two ten and hundred year storm have been elevated from previous you know traditional type three runoff uh, rainfall data. So. Um, th this is the 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 more intense or, or the more uh, heavily durated storms, if you will, that we that that we're analyzing. We're also governed by the metric that we need to mitigate our peak flow off site. So if there is any bypass uh, in a catch basin, um, it it has to it, we we have to make sure that we it is it is uh, the peak flows are are mitigated and. We do that by, although be it minor, uh, there there is a reduction of impervious area on this site. So that so it's so this site's considered a redevelopment. So under Mass DEP standards, uh, there's a different sort of standards, if you will, in terms of mitigating or or um, uh, meeting redevelopment standards, by which peak flow mitigation is is still required, and which and which is shown in the HydroCAD calculations. So I guess I'm, my question is, do you think it's enough or, or you know, is, I, I, you know, it's sort of, I mean, I can't, no one can predict the future, but I understand what you're saying about the changing standards, but is it enough 20, 30 years from now when we're seeing much, much more rain? Um, Cause it's all going to go to the common you know, or somewhere. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, I, I would say, yes, it, it is sufficient because we're governed by the regulations that are that are before us. It, 20, 30 years from now, that means all infrastructure in town would need to be upgraded. Okay. But when you say that you are governed, the regulations give you a minimum that you have to do. It doesn't preclude you from doing more. And I think the gist of Janet's question is, would it be good engineering to perhaps do more than the regulations are requiring at this point. Sure, I mean, I guess I'll defer to my client on that. <laughs> right, yeah. okay. Well, uh, I also note that the, it looks like the grade toward the south is, across the property line is falling. 
And so we'll, is it likely that some of the water that's coming around the southwest corner is actually going to head keep going south rather than turn the corner? Um, uh, I would I would say it, it all depends on the fine grading. I'll admit that 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 asphalt really is is tied into the the abutting asphalt directly to the south. You'll notice though that I I I'd argue that if you look at Tom, if you can point to elevation three twenty one, right there. So the 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 dark contour, the darker thicker contour, is the proposed contour, where the existing contour is the dash contour. As you can see there, we're we're creating more of I'll call it a ridge uh, or or a high point in that southerly lot line, and we're 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 more inviting or encouraging the water to stay on our property and head more in an easterly direction as opposed to a southeasterly direction. So, um, while while there may be some bleed off in, in the southerly southerly direction, I would argue that it, that it would be no more than the existing condition. Uh huh. Okay. All right, Tom, you want to, is there any more, uh, what other drawings do you want to show us? I don't know that there needs to, I mean, we really covered a lot, I think, through the architectural piece, uh, and to a certain extent, the site is what the site is. Um, so I don't know that we need to go into anything more, as far as I'm concerned, uh, okay. with the site plan, but I'll defer right. to this um, press trip on the board. Chris, I see your hand, and I had one other question. So I wonder ahead. if... Um, Mr. Henry or Mr. Reedy can talk about the roof drainage. I think some of the roof drainage goes into the catch basin in the driveway and some of the roof drainage goes in a different direction. So just, you know, give the board a sense of what happens there. Yeah, I could talk about that. The, 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 the new portion of the building and the overhang along the colonnade or the arcade along the front Will be captured and 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 piped into that existing catch basin in the alleyway. The Hastings building has, as I understand it, has a roof drain leader, and and um, Jonathan may have to help me with this in the back right corner or the northwesterly corner that that discharges in a northerly direction. So, essentially, that that the mercantile building is is that watershed and that capture area is remaining unchanged from the existing and. To the proposed condition so essentially the existing building to remain is heading north and the new building is heading south thank you all right and then uh, i was just going to ask uh, for the vehicles that are supposed to be potentially using the two parking spaces are the turning radiuses adequate is there adequate room for them to, for those vehicles to actually get into those spaces you know, it looks like they would have to go over into the Brody building area in, which, in, in order to, you know, get into the space. Yeah, that, I would say that's a fair assessment. Um, pulling into the space, uh, they, they could probably pull into the space. Backing out, a typical car probably needs 22 feet to, to, to properly back out and then come out of that area. So, yeah, there might be a temporary backing out onto in a southerly direction. Okay, and is that has that fact been discussed with the adjacent property owner? We haven't talked to them yet about that, um, but I think there's existing conditions that probably do the, where the same thing is done. Yeah, okay. All right, Janet? Um, in the development application report, the question was raised about like, who are those spaces for? Are they for it, the use of the tenants? Are they for commercial people who are using, you know, is it parking for people using the Hastings building? And then, you know, had, how are those being allocated in a certain way? And then if there's EV charging and it's going to be ADA spaces for tenants, so that's, is, you know, sort of what's the thinking there kind of thing? What How are they being used? So there is there is going to be an EV charger. I believe it's going to be against the building. Uh, and Chris, we can show that on the, the next plan if we need to, but it's going to be on the building, not just out in this uh, sidewalk. Uh, the ADA space is an ADA space. I, I don't think these are dedicated to tenants uh, or visitors. I think it's more 
as Jonathan had mentioned, drop off um, is is more likely what these are going to be, not somewhere where somebody could come park. Um, you know, any tenant is going to have it, and it's not related to that uh, commercial space. Will they will they be signed for you know fifteen minute parking? Keep yeah. your blinkers on, or get a permit from the from the Hastings building, or how? Yeah, they'll be they'll be managed uh, appropriately. I'm what? not sure, frankly, what that looks like, but they'll be managed appropriately. Why would you put an EV charger in a temporary spot? It seems, I mean, unless it's a supercharger. I think we have to. I think it's a code. Yes, that uh, I'll chime in here. The the latest round of of um, uh, energy code requirements uh, mandate a, a minimum. <laughs> yeah, I think obviously if we had no parking, we wouldn't have to provide it. But once we do, I think we have to provide that that minimum one. Huh. It seems unfortunate that you couldn't use it for like overnight charging by one of the residents or something, but it, it doesn't. But I could see the need for the drop off too. So I'm kind of a little lost. Yeah. Okay. Um, Bruce. Um, I've been thinking for quite uh, a while about not on this project, but generally a, a societal EY how uh, people in apartment buildings uh, charge or will come to charge uh, their uh, EVs because if, as we are being told, that uh, the transition uh, away from fossil fuels happens and it's going to happen well within the first half of the span of this building. So reasonably, we uh, should be, the people who are building buildings these days should be imagining how they're going to function in a, a, a fully renewable energy uh, energy uh, economy um and i think you know clearly the world is a long way short of that but it doesn't mean that we can't pick away at the edges of it and one of the things i've been wondering is how do uh buildings like this uh support people who who live in them who own evs and i think there's probably going to be lots of questions to that and that they charge them in remote places and so forth but i i i I think uh, giving some thought to how this eventually you could put more EV charging in here and maybe both of those spaces would be or, um, but I think it's a, a some somehow or other, I'm sure there is going to be uh, um, changes in the way these parking gets used as, as time goes by uh, related to, for example, the need for people to charge their vehicles. And I think we probably just have to accept that 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 evolution will happen out of our control, but if the uh, if Barry or, or or Jonathan have any ideas about how we could uh, facilitate that transition somewhat, I uh, it, it would be a nice thing to be thinking about. I don't, I'm not asking for a response to this. I'm just making a public comment, really. So I, I, in this case, I would expect that that we have two places. There will be one charging unit. Um, and often those come with two heads, although, you know, depending on how this one is actually used, which is, you know, admittedly a little, a little clearer to all of us at this point, as we go through this transition, um, it, you know, the cords, if it's placed in centrally, the cord can reach either vehicle, even if it isn't a dual headed one. Okay. Um, Janet, are you coming back? Yeah. Could, is it possible that you could, you know, meet the new code by putting the EV charger in front of the Hastings building. So people, it'd be actually useful to people. Um, Cause it just, well, it seems like you're putting- point it would be on town infrastructure. I, I think that would be the, 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 the challenge. Um, yeah, it just seems like they're going in and no one's gonna use them. And it just seems kind of tragic to me. And I wonder if you could put it in front of the Hastings building, someone can charge for at least two hours. Or long get used. What? I think he said it would be used. I mean, you know, it may be that, you know, I suppose, Tom, that maybe the landlord might schedule its use for, you know, allow tenants to park there long enough to charge. And I don't know. I think I, it's going to be an evolution without getting yeah. into, I, I just, I think to Janet's point and, and Jonathan's, it's a little bit of a transition and we're trying to navigate how to best utilize it while balancing 
non-abuse of folks parking there just to charge when somebody else may free. be, et cetera, et cetera. So right. yeah. I guess one question that this drawing brings to mind <clears throat> for me is, you know, it looks like if you removed the uh, section of wall, right, exactly, you could get at least one more space, if not two more, probably not only one with the ADA requirements, but, you know, would it be worthwhile putting in a beam across that and getting a third space out of it? And I don't want to talk for Jonathan, but I'm going to a little bit. I mean, we if we went back to the elevations, looking at it from the southerly facade, I mean, you've got a lot of consistency with the yep. spacing of yep. those. And then I'm going to put my engineer's hat on and we're talking about, you know, this is an accessible path also. And all of a sudden, if you put, I think I would just be hesitant to put another parking space in here, because what does that then do to the path from this ADA space to here to get in, right? So there's there's landing, there's slopes and grades that we have to take into consideration. Um, so I think I'll those would be my too. We, we actually did not have that pier there for a while. We had a large... Uh, opening and it just it looked rather bizarre and it it's a huge beam to go that far so uh -huh. it we added it back in because we could still get the two spaces easily and it uh it improved the appearance from the on the south side okay and uh the walkway that's running inside sort of under the building that's east of the parking spaces could you bring the the first floor plan back tom sure I'm just wondering, is there window from the? Yes, there is. There's under that arcade as Tom gets that up. Uh, there, there are. There's sort of a storefront um, from, that from will the look amenity out. spaces. Yeah, that's correct. So you're not going to be just walking between a, no. a blank wall and a, some piers. Yeah, scroll, no, scroll the, the other direction. One? Yeah. There you go. This in here. Yeah. All right. So those are windows. Okay. And you're saying that the westernmost of those of those doors is the accessible entrance to the first floor. Or Bill, yes. scroll scroll down, just bring up that more detailed plan. Thanks. Yep. There we go. So yes, the westernmost door uh, is the. Okay. I think if you uh, zoom in a little bit, Tom, the, the clarity at least for my screen gets better. There you go. Okay, so if you're in the accessible parking space, you ex you you'll have a fob or some way to get in that door. That's correct. If you live there <laughs> and uh, you can come in that way. All right. Okay. It's all a little um, unusual in the sense that, you know, two parking spaces is, is, is atypical for this many apartments in a, in a sense, so. Yeah. Bruce? Uh, good question to ask while this plans up. Uh, the bike storage, uh, is there any in, uh, uh, intention to provide uh, charging for electric uh, e-bikes and so forth in there? And, and I ask that because I understand that at the moment there's some concern about the, uh, the, the instability of uh, these uh, uh, batteries and so forth. And so is, 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 that, uh, is that a possible, is it possible to put uh, um, uh, bike charging in there without um, improving the fire rating of the walls there and closing it, for example. I have to say we have not gotten to that level of detail in my head. At least it was we were designing it around your typical uh, human powered uh, bike, not a not an electric powered bike. Um, but the uh, the folks who live here without cars, I'm going to guess, are going to be perhaps a strong uh, market for e-bikes than uh, average and this is also nice and secure which is another thing that e-bikes would want they, if you've got this valuable bike you would like to have a place like this to store so it really is uh, the dominoes are leaning towards uh, e-bikes i thought and so i'm just asking whether that might be a, a feature that is provided and hopefully it can be done so or i mean that at least from a regulatory standpoint mm -hmm. Yeah, good, good point, Bruce. 
All right, I'm going to go back to the member of the public with the phone number only and see if we can bring them in and give them an opportunity to speak again. So, uh, Mr. or Mrs. 413-549-0810, let's try to bring that person over to allow them to speak. And Tom, you can stop your share for the moment. All right, welcome to the plan <clears throat> planning board. Uh, please give us your name and your address. My name, name is Vincent O'Connor. I live at 175 Summer Street in Amherst. And I, I have a number of declarative statements and I'll be happy to clarify them after I make them. Um, and I, I think the first thing I would say is that the somewhat Rube Goldberg nature of the parking and vehicular access um, issues should give the planning board pause about um, rendering its approval. Um, with respect to affordable units, rather than accept cash, my view is since the, the uh, developer, the applicant, um, has other units within town, some under construction, others already constructed, that the board require that the applicant make available on a one-for-one -one basis at the same time, the, if the building is granted an occupancy permit, that the units, that the affordable units in other buildings owned by, this, by the person be made available for as affordable units um, and, and not have, have it be done by cash. If this were a different situation, the cash issue might be the only way to do it. But this is not, and the owner has plenty of other units in town that he could set aside as affordable and make available at the, on the very same day when the um, uh, when the occupancy permit is granted. Um, on issues regarding um, rainfall and so forth, I would urge the board to look at the the um, standards, the the former standards, the one that are being referred to now, and and make a judgment about whether they should order more. Um, if if you know that within the lifetime of the building, there's going to have to be an upgrade. I think the board is every is absolutely within its power to order that the that the the drainage uh, be sufficient. Um, to cover the lifetime of the building. Um, additionally, I have other views about downtown buildings um, looking to the future rather than just to the immediate present related to um, the need, university's need for housing for students. That in fact, um, in downtown buildings, the bottom two floors should be uh, required to be built to commercial use standards. And um, that would mean make it uh, those, those the second floor available for commercial use uh, in the future. And I would say that one uh, uh, the the Jones Building on Coles Road, the one on the north side of Coles Road, the the only building of theirs there that's newly built, um, they regret it not having built the second floor to for commercial use. Um, because they had people wanting to use it, but they couldn't because the um, the second and third floors of that building, the three-story building, were built only um, uh, for residential to residential use standards. Uh, Mr. Um, O'Connor, your your time has elapsed. If you could, um, I'm I have I have more to say that's not a repetition of anything, and um, that that are substantial comments. To, I've been listening on this phone for two and a half hours, and um, and I I will not repeat myself or repeat something that somebody else has said, and I I would request that the board allow me to present um, the information the concerns that I have. I will give you two more minutes. Okay. 
I, I have not heard anything about the level of energy um, uh, efficiency of the building, um, and maybe I missed it, but solar access and so forth. Um, the four-bedroom issue, I would say um, repair to Kendrick Place and the Jones Building on Coles Road. They, they have had, both have had troubles renting out the four bedroom units. And quite frankly, the board needs to prohibit the owner from renting out the individual bedrooms in these four bedrooms or any other bedroom as essentially and running a rooming house when you have, when you have approved an apartment building. And that is being done in town um, completely uh, out in the open. Uh, and the, the other concern that I didn't hear about was a serious flaw in the Kendrick Place building where the, the enclosed stairwell, um, you know, fire safety stairwell and so forth, instead of opening to the outside, opens to, into the lobby. The billing commissioner, with, when I made comments about that, he said that the board had, in that case, had tied his hands and that he was unable to order a, a different um, uh, means of egress. I do not think that the, a safety enclosed doorway uh, stairwell should be exiting into the lobby of the building, that it should exit to the outside. Um, and as it does in some of the other buildings that have been built since. All right, you um, have 15 seconds. Yes, and I, I would say that um, I, I do not agree that, the, that in essence the upper limit prescribed by the zoning bylaw should in fact be the lower limit and that the board would have to justify doing something other than the upper limit. I think I have not heard a good, I don't really agree with the five story building. Okay. I think All right. Two I'm commercial gonna, floors and, uh, I'm gonna cut and two you residential off. floors would be more appropriate. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, board members, anything else you want to share? Uh, anything else you want to say with the design team this evening? Bruce? Um, there's a, a couple of things in the development uh, application reports that uh, was circulated that we might want to yep. uh, mention. I think we're clearly headed towards a continuation here. But uh, for example, the, uh, um, the, the, it, it, uh, the, the staff say that we should have clarification on the ground plane location so that we get an average finished grade. In other words, there should be some, uh, uh, I would imagine, diagrammatic or computational uh, um, support for how we are measuring the height for the building. We're being, I think, are we asking for a uh, anyway, it's it's pushing the the boundary, uh, and so we we should we should make sure that that uh, that height computation is um, is clinically uh, documented. I think I think that's what the development report is asking, and I mention that only because apparently it hasn't yet been so. And I think uh, rather than bringing it up at the next meeting, it would be good to do it now so that it's uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's it's done. And I, uh, Bruce, I see uh, Chris's hand go up. She may have a comment about that. Sure. I was unaware that Mr. Reedy had provided that information, and so we do have it, and it looks correct. The building commissioner hasn't looked at it as far as I know, but we will do that before the next meeting. So thank you, Mr. Colden, for bringing that up. But I think that we have the information that we need now, and I think Pam has put it in the packet. Okay. Yes, I, I have to say I'm the the I only get my packets online, and I wasn't able to find the uh, DRB report in the packet online, and I haven't seen anything from the fire department. So it, it seems that folks that uh, have their packets nailed to the back door of the town hall are doing better than I am. Well, that's uh, a change. <laughs> so, but but uh, so I think. Uh, 
I'll go uh, I'll go through that DRB and 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 see what because quite a lot of it has been answered in the conversation and so forth. And and if there's anything that from uh, that I think might need some preparation, uh, I guess I could email it to you, Chris, and uh, and you could forward it to the applicant. So I guess we don't really need to go through it anymore. Uh, well, I mean, uh, Chris, I assume you've shared this draft DR uh, development report with uh, Mr. Reedy and the design team. We have shared it. There, there was some mix up last week. I'm not exactly sure what it was, but it turned out that some people who got paper packets got more information than people who got electronic packets. But I think we've got that straightened out now and the electronic packets do contain everything. Um, and so we apologize for a little bit of a mix up, but I think we, we have more information now than we had when I wrote the development application report. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so we could go through that, that draft that you prepared and, and make sure we've touched on each of your questions. Uh, Mr. Reedy, wouldn't that make sense to do this evening so that you've gotten the fullest conversation this evening you can get we'd appreciate that all right all right so um i guess before i start janet your hand is up is there something you'd like to say before we start through the development application report well i i kind of think i mean it seems like we're going to go to another meeting um anyway because we don't have um any like anything from the town engineer um, and that, you know, for me, the outstanding issues would be, um, you know, the the affordable housing, tr the the inclusionary zoning units, whether they should be in the building. Um, I would love to hear from the housing trust their thoughts on that. And then also, if it's this building is like twenty two, you know, units with I don't know, you know, seventy five students, that brings up the issue of having on site management twenty four hours, which is a requirement we've had for other you know, buildings that have admitted or are intended to be for students. And so I don't, you know, I, I think that's an issue that we need to discuss. I don't think we have to discuss it tonight, but I think those are things I see that are on the hook in terms of what I'm, you know, concerned about. So, well, um, Janet, uh, we, my memory is that we talked about the on-site supervision on Olymp in the projects on Olympia Drive which is in the, I forget if it's called the fraternity zone or whatever the zoning think, is where it's explicitly limited to student housing. And I think 11 East Pleasant, we also required it. I'm pretty sure. I don't, I don't think so. But I, I'm, I mean, you know. certainly when I walk by that building, there is no staff person at a front desk. I thought there was somebody living there, but maybe I should double check. But yeah, I, I, so I think that's an issue to talk about, like if there's 88 students there, um, you know, as as Karin has said, things can go wrong very quickly and usually on a weekend. So so those are issues I think we need to discuss. I don't think we should maybe go tonight because mm -hmm. it's on. OK, well, I guess, you know, I think Tom was clear that this is a market development and whoever responds to the market offering it's not automatic that it would be all students, but it certainly could be the majority. Um, we're not far from the police department. <laughs> so anyway. And they're busy <laughs> on a Saturday night. Yeah. So I just, I, I'm just sort of, you know, issues to discuss at our next meeting. So. Uh -huh. Bruce? Uh, for the record, I think uh, I should say that my observation earlier applied to the uh, apartment layouts in the new building. Uh, there are five apartment layouts in the older building, which are far more, um, what you might say, family uh, appropriate. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So let's see. Uh, maybe I'll, does, does everybody have the development application report? Uh, that they can look at, or do we need to put it on the screen? I guess if anybody wants it on the screen, you can raise your hand, and otherwise I'll just sort of work with my paper copy, Bruce, uh, and uh, and see what we what we want to talk about here. So the first uh, first page is the request and the project data. 
not having had any previous uh, permitting on this site. Much of the second page has to do with the, uh, the dimensional requirements and, and Chris has highlighted the issue about the building height, which I guess is now basically moot. Um, continues with a project description. Uh, the site third page site visit and waivers. Uh, traffic impact statement has been requested as a waiver. That's still the case, right, Tom? Correct. Okay. Um, then under issues, we have architecture, a description of the architecture um, issues, uh, mechanical equipment. Do we want a detail of the screening? Uh, obviously, um, Jonathan's package had a section through the screening. And I guess if members want any more detail on that, um, we should we should have that, you should raise that uh, comment. Chris? That detail I didn't have. I may have had it, but I didn't this. know I had it um, when I wrote the report. So okay. now we have it. So if you need more, you can ask for that. All right. The next question you had was about the parapet on the stair and elevator tower. Um, and uh, the fact that the parapet on that section of the building is higher. Uh, Chris at least is asking whether it ought to be lowered. Um, I think Jonathan, that may have I, also been one of the, the partial questions from the from the DRB too. I think there was some back and forth on yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, I assume you did that for architectural reasons to uh, make it to, to distinguish it from the rest of the new building. That is correct. All right. That was a conscious choice. Um, and how much does that higher parapet con con contribute to the higher building height that you are asking permission it, for? It doesn't, as the way we've understood the definition, you know, that's to the highest point of the, the roof, um, but items like parapets, screen fencing, uh, penthouses don't count towards that. Okay. All right. Um, how will the ground floor doors on the west and north side of the building be prevented from staying open? Uh, will they be have a, some sort of monitoring alarm, alarm yes. or yeah. you know monitor that they're open and somebody ought to come and pay attention to that? Yes. All right. Uh, I think. Uh, the next comment had to do with the residential support spaces, and you've now labeled the plans more than we were we originally saw. So I think that's been taken care of. Site improvements, um, description of site improvements. I'm going to page four. Issues to consider: Should the proposed bench on the south side of the building match the new benches installed on the common? Uh, maybe when you come back, you ought to have some cuts for the benches sure. and the and the bike uh you know the bike racks and if there are any outside i think there are there there is um, at least one outside so that we have a little more uh complete picture of the site accessories if i can call it that and then um are the concrete pavers going to be installed on a concrete bed to be keep them from heaving. Um, you know, I think at least when you do bricks, you often have at least a bituminous, if not a concrete setting bed underneath it. Here no, we will, we'll, Mr. Here, Chair. Here we would like to have a, a stone bed so that we can adjust them and make sure they stay level. Uh, Barry has a similar uh, series of ramps in the cinema building that he did out of pavers. We're looking at a larger format paper this time. Um, but they've stayed nice and level again like this they'll be covered so okay uh so coordination of the bike rack locations between the drawings um oh here's the here's the request for the details on the rack and the bench and the handrails yeah concrete walls and the screening which we already have uh historical commission yes we know we uh, tom started with that description Landscape plan, I'm going to page five. Issues to consider. Have a more detailed landscape plan for the number and species of plants. 
Um, I, I, I will ask if are any of the plants that are proposed, are they considered invasive or are they uh, by and large native plants that are considered benign? We, as far as we know, we have not included anything that's invasive. Um, the screening right around the um, uh, transformer is called out as Inkberry Holly, which I believe is a, a, a native, North American native. Um, the bed closest to the door has rhododendrons in it. Some rhododendrons are are, are native, some are not. Um, okay. Uh, and what about irrigation? Are any of the beds uh, proposed to be irrigated? Not yet, but we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll put a yard hydrant in, so there'll they'll be irrigation there. Uh-huh. Um, oh, and then there's a question about uh, potentially having some shade tolerant plantings on the north side of the building. Do we have space for that or do you need to keep that hardscape? Uh, I, personally, I think I would tend to, to keep it hardscape. Um, I think people are going to transit through those areas. Um, that's at least my take on it. Yeah. yeah, and I think as a practical matter, you're you're on the north side of the. I mean, I don't know that those plants are going to survive, even if they're shade tolerant, okay. given where they were going to be. So I think hardscape there makes the most sense. All right, uh, lighting plan. Will the lights on the exterior be motion activated or do they have a time at which they will be turned off? It sounds like you'll probably be on at least either a light sensor or a timer to go Correct. from roughly dawn to dusk. Yes. Or, or dusk to dawn. Dusk to dawn. <laughs> um, okay, a question about the lighting levels on the north and the west sides that they appear to be actually pretty high. Um, you know, uh, I, I don't remember exactly the numbers that were in that area. I did see some pretty high numbers, I think, on the south side. Um, you know, we have had projects where we thought that the lighting was actually too intense and that it might be better to be slightly uh, less. Bruce? They're about uh, 10 lumens, I think, or for candles, as much the same. And, and that's a I mean, inside that would be a, a corridor lighting level, uh, a, a low corridor lighting level. So outside that's, but I think that in that location, uh, particularly on the north side, and I think the way it's 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 channeled between walls. So I, I think that that level of lighting would feel uh, would make one feel secure uh, in a in a space that I know, having walked around there. Um, these days at night, you know, when you're particularly when I was uh, leaving my office late and walking around to the cinema or something like that, I used to use that uh, passageway quite a lot after dark. And uh, this is why I'm looking forward to having a brighter. So I think the lighting level is actually a, 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 gen, a, a generous allocation uh, that would probably be appreciated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the lighting levels are at their brightest, kind of where, as Bruce said, you know, but between the, the cinema and, and our building or this proposed project, you know, they drop off as you get towards the, the adjoining buildings along Main Street. Mm -hmm. Do you think you'll end up with a camera back there? You know, we haven't talked about that yet, but it wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> it's certainly around those doors, you know, it's another way to, yeah. you know, other than a, an alarm going off to, to kind of know if someone's propped the doors open or if someone's, you know, building a nest back there someplace. Right. Well, it might be worth considering. Okay, um, app, more on the lighting. Let's see. Nope, that was, that was everything on the lighting. Erosion, will there be additional erosion control around the <clears throat> perimeter of the site to prevent siltration of surrounding properties? during excavation and construction. Uh, I'm not sure what they, Chris, what you mean by additional, I assume there will be the, whatever's required to control the, the site at the, during construction. They really just showed um, protection of the catch basins as far as I could tell. So I wondered if there was something more that needed to be done or should uh -huh. be done 
around the perimeter of the site, maybe um, the team could look at that and, you know, just think about whether that's needed or not, and then come back with an answer next time. Okay. Good. Utilities, um, I guess. Okay, so then the uh, location of the electrical meters, uh, we might want to know where that is. Uh, some concern about the trenching for utilities, uh, and that maybe there would be more site trenching than you suggested. Um, so and... may, I, may I talk about that one for a minute? Sure, um, Chris. It looked like that they were only going to repair or replace the sidewalk um, that goes across the driveway and whatever is in front of the um, existing building. But in fact, they're trenching through that bump out. And I think on the site visit, Barry, Barry agreed that, yes, he would be rebuilding that bump out. But I think it needs to show on the plan that that is going to be rebuilt and not just, you know, left in a kind of patchwork fashion. Okay. I assume everyone else understands what the bump out is because I actually don't. But I, if you all do, that's fine. I don't need to have it explained to me. <laughs> Okay, um, drainage. Okay, we have talked about the drainage. And, you know, I think, I think uh, Tom and, and Barry, you probably ought to recognize, I think there's some concern. Um, you know, I think uh, a little more, uh, another catch basin or two would probably be much appreciated. Um, Let's see, drainage from the canopy. Uh, Jonathan, I assume at some point you'll have a, a, a downspout or. I think we're gonna bring it back to an internal drain and, have an internal? and it'll go into the same drainage uh, that the, the upper roof will go into. Okay. So I, don't, I don't want the risk of something backing up and or spilling off the edge and then icing up on, yeah. the, on the tail end of that ramp. So okay. on the stair. All right, so that would be good to uh, at least Give us your strategy in, in, on the graphics. Yeah. Parking. Uh, we talked about the EV parking station. Who will use them? It sounds like we don't really know yet, do we? <laughs> um, but I think if there's any way to elaborate a little bit on the, the management plan about how you intend to, uh, to manage those, you know, I think that would be appreciated. And then will the applicant provide information for tenants on where to find parking downtown? Uh, I assume that's, is that a flyer, Chris, that the town produces that, that landlords can then provide to their tenants on we, when they sign the lease? We have a map showing where parking is available downtown. And I think the library is passing that out to their um to the users of the library. And they've come up with a kind of elaborate um explanation of the fact that you know they've got so many buses going by and what routes they are and different things if tom would like me to do that i can send him a copy of the library's parking management plan which includes all this information so i would do that great. thank you yeah i think that would that might be something that you know if in your spare time chris uh if the town had a had a publication like that that would be great mm -hmm. um Bruce, I see your hand. Did I pass by something you wanted to comment on? Well, I I, I think uh, Barry's lease uh, that we were given, uh, which I can't say I read, but I skimmed through it, and I, I there's a there's a number of things on page sixteen that uh, the lessee acknowledges uh, receipt, and one of them is uh, a parking or um, could be a parking plan. It's not, but on page twenty two there is. Uh, a statement that uh, that the town that the parking plan is is being uh, so there seems to be uh, um, uh, references in in the lease document that uh, the uh, landlord intends that the uh, tenant acknowledge receipt of a parking plan at least that's what it says on page twenty two it should probably also say it on page sixteen so I think it sounds like they're actually doing that okay thank you for thank you for looking at that. Okay, um, I'm on page seven. Uh, the ANR plan. 
Is that something that'll be coming at some point soon, Tom, or does it not need to happen until you've got drawings farther along? I think the latter. So we would accept the condition of approval that prior to receipt of a building permit, we uh, receive an endorsement of an A&R. Okay. Yeah. Chris, that would be good for us to note when we're putting together conditions. Uh, and okay. So then about the uh, inclusionary zoning and the affordable units, the, off, the, the request to make the payment in lieu. Uh, Tom, have you had any conversations with the Housing Trust at this point? Not yet, but I know they meet next Thursday night, and I, I had reached out to Nate Malloy, and he had suggested that we get on the agenda. I think Nate's on this call, so hopefully we'll be there next Thursday to have that conversation with the trust and to come back to this board. You know, I, ideally, we're back on the 20th and, and having this conversation, hopefully, for approval that, that evening. So Right. Uh, yeah, it'd be helpful to know their position, whether it comes probably directly from them to Chris, preferably. Uh, Bruce. Um, I hesitate to ask this, but because I know Barry, I think I will. Uh, I also know Vince. Um, and we don't usually uh, necessarily uh, uh, respond to public comment, but sometimes we do. And on this one, I guess I would like to ask Barry whether he thought that uh, Vince O'Connor's idea that uh, people who uh, establish developers in town um, could be uh, not expected to, but asked to uh, do something along the lines of Vince suggested, does Barry think that's a good idea? Um, or is this uh, something that uh, should be discouraged and that we should uh, simply rely on uh, what the what you bylaw says in Article 15, which is that there's a formula for doing this. But it was a, oh. it was a question, and I would be interested, since we have the uh, horse here in the room, to ask whether this is a good idea or not. Yeah, I get Barry. Before you before you respond, I wanted to say I went through my head that even though Barry's involved in both of these, you know, in this project and other projects, the actual ownership may differ across projects so that it may not be quite as easy to move the chess pieces around as we think. So well, I suspect that that's true. And, and that's why I thought, uh, because it's probably, the people listen to these things and they watch yeah. them and so forth. I think it would be good to put this to bed if it, there is a bed in which to put it. Okay, all right, Barry. I think you're right. Uh, one of the problems is that all the projects don't have the same partners. I mean, I happen to be lead in most of them, but they're not the same partners. Uh, it might be something that we'd be able to work out in this instance if it came to that. I think we're very interested to go to the meeting with the Housing Trust Fund and really talk with them and see what they believe is the most important. I, I would make a comment about uh, Vince's comment about, uh, if it's all right with you, Mr. Chair. Certainly. Uh, about preparing the second floor for commercial. Uh, as you know, or as I know, and Jonathan knows, the codes to develop for commercial and residential are completely different. Uh, so it's very expensive to prepare for commercial on a second level and then use it for residential. I mean, you have to have cast iron and copper plumbing as opposed to plastic and PVC. Uh, so those I, I really don't think the market is calling for that. I think the market is more calling for residential units. And uh, I'm fine with putting uh, commercial on the first level. Okay. Chris, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I wanted to mention another reason that it would be difficult to transfer the affordable unit requirement from one property to another because each property has its own decisions. And um, in those decisions is written how many affordable units and at what level of affordability um, there were, that particular project is required to um, to have. And so if you tried to move, you know, affordable units from one project to another, you'd end up having to redo the permitting or uh, modify the permitting on the project to which the units were going. So it's more complicated than it seems on the face of it. Okay, thank you. 
All right. Uh, well, I can say as a member of CPAC this past season, uh, I think they came to CPAC looking for about a half a million dollars in funding to continue their work. And uh, I'm sure they, I expect, I'm not sure, but I expect that they would be pleased to have this influx of money. But I think it's an interesting conversation with them about whether they'd like to have some money in hand to do kind of for them to decide what happens or whether they'd prefer to just see three or four more units happen in town soon. So, okay. Um, special permit, I'm on page eight, related to lot coverage. Um, so this would be a finding. You, you were saying, Tom, that the reduction in non-conforming lot coverage will is not uh, detrimental. Substantially more detrimental, yes. All right. Uh, how many adjectives and, and negatives can we put, put in one sentence? Right? Get those lawyers in a room, right? Don't do, don't do it. Okay. Moving farther down, the mixed-use building. Um, the 30% mixed use. And, um, you know, I think we will want to see if, if it's not already on the drawings, Jonathan, we will want to see some actual calculations with a, with a stamp at some point uh, that we are, you are over that 30% number. Um, and in terms of the 50% dwelling units, Sounds, it looks like you are under the 50%. And maybe that's, uh, this comment just came because Chris didn't have your summary at the time she did this, uh, this draft. Construction logistics, uh, I'm on page nine. Sign plan, traffic impact. Uh, issues for traffic. Board may wish to consider the issue of pedestrians crossing the driveway access and whether it is necessary to install signs to indicate that traffic may be entering or exiting the driveway. Um, I guess uh, Tom or Jonathan or even Philip, is there any thoughts about that? I, I based on the, the small number of parking spaces, I, I'd be hard pressed to say that the traffic's going to be changing much and whether we've whether we, the, we have an increased need for signage is I would say anything a reduced number of, of, right. of, of tra transits across that sidewalk. Um, there's more parking behind the building today than there will be after the development. So, uh -huh. but. All right, Janet. So on that issue, I wondered if like a change in the surface for somebody walking by would kind of alert them that something's different. Because, <clears throat> you know, I, those those are kind of funky little exits and entryways. And, you know, I, you know, I've been walking along and been a little startled to see a car there. So I wonder if there was some way, I don't know if it's paint or it's some kind of change in surface. So as you're walking, you sort of stop and say, oh, it's different. Uh, will the side, the public sidewalk be reconstructed in the, in front of the project? Yes, it will. OK. So maybe the the surface treatment is something to consider as you come back with uh, a little more detail on this on the site. Uh, Karen. So I'm I'm thinking that in the future there's going to be really a lot of electric bicycles, and if you're going to have any kind of families, there'll be bigger electric bicycles where children can be in the back. So. Um, there, you know, there's that also that traffic coming from the storage area where uh, I think I talked to Barry about the charging stations and he mentioned that there would be um, charging stations for electric bicycles. I think we have to realistically say that we're moving in that direction probably pretty fast. And as far as um, traffic goes, I'm a big proponent of having uh, these things be marked on the sideway, sidewalk so that you have sort of uh, bicycle lanes kind of clear on the sidewalk. But this, that's another thing. But think of 
I don't think you need signage here, but consider that there's also bicycles, not just these two cars that are there. Okay, good point. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and then going farther down to the bottom of the page, um, yes, we still need town engineer review and uh, work within the town right of way will need to be or may need to be approved by the town council. So I assume you will coordinate any of that with Chris. Yes. All right, so that's the full draft. If, if nobody, does anybody have uh, further comments that we want to make this evening? Uh, we've exhausted you all. <laughs> it's true. Uh, Karen, is your hand for no, another comment? Great. Sorry. Okay. All right. Um, in that case, the time now is 9.32. Oh, Bruce, go ahead. You are muted. Bruce, you are muted. Well, still a slow learner. Uh, <laughs> I, you're, I think about to uh, support my motion for a continuation by uh, examining the date and time. But uh, I'm about, I will move for continuation with the date and time. Uh, uh, okay. Um, I know. <laughs> That's fine, Karen. Uh, but we need to nail down the details for you guys. Um, Tom, you mentioned March 20th, two weeks from tonight, our next meeting. Chris, does that work for you? I think it works for us if I can get um, Pam to agree to that. Yep. Yep. Okay. Okay. And do we want to do that at 635 or... You know, I mean, as the first item, the first substantive item on the agenda. That sounds yes. good. Yes. All right. So, uh, Bruce and Karen, we would amend your motion to be uh, to continue to March twentieth at six thirty-five p.m. If you are uh, in support of that, I see a thumbs up from Bruce. I see. Thumb, a thumb and a shaking from, from Karen. So, all right, so that's the motion on the floor. Any comments from the board before we run through a motion to continue? A vote yes is to continue and a vote no is to keep going this evening. All right, so <laughs> Bruce, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead with a roll call. Um, Bruce? Uh, I vote yes. And um, Janet? Yes. All right. Johanna? Yes. Karen? Yes. And I'm an I, uh, an I as well. So that's, uh, I guess, five members in favor, two members absent. Thank you, Mr. Reedy. Thank you, Mr. Roberts and your team. We'll see you in two weeks. See you soon. Thank you very much. All right. Good night. Good night. Okay, time now is 6.34, and we'll go on to the next item in the agenda. That is old business uh, regarding our site plan and special permit, site plan review and special permit for the, the new Fort River Elementary School. Um, Chris, do you want to introduce this, or how would you like to proceed? Sure, I would be happy to introduce it. There was um, a question about... I, I think I sent out um, some potential conditions, and when you reviewed the conditions last time you were talking about the Fort River School, you came upon one that had to do with um, screening of mechanical units on the roof. And the um, applicant who is here, Tim Cooper, he's on behalf of Denisco, and Rick Rice is also here, and Donna Denisco, um, and Kathy Shane, and I'm sorry that you had to wait so long. But in any event, um, they said that they hadn't um, included screening of the mechanicals on the roof because they didn't think they would be seen from um, really from anywhere. 
Um, but then uh, the board, um, you know, questioned that. And so we came up with a potential condition of um, anything that's within 25 feet of the edge of the roof um, should be screened and anything beyond that should, should doesn't need to be screened. But then um, <clears throat> when we presented that to the board members via email, um, Ms. McGowan said that she thought that this really should be discussed in public. So we're bringing it to you to discuss it in public and um, hope that you will come to an agreement about what needs to right. be done. And and the I do understand that they didn't include the cost estimate for a lot of screening of mechanicals within their cost estimate for the project. And so that's of a concern to um, this the people on that team. I think that's a an explanation. Yep. yep. Um, Chris, would you mind reading the uh, condition that you were proposing? Oh, you would ask that. Let's see. Do I have that? I, you know, I didn't find it. In I think the... I do. Yes, here it is. Oh, good. Um, the one that we proposed was all air, all air conditioning units and other mechanical equipment that is located within with within it should have said 25 feet of the edge of the roof shall be screened such equipment that is located more than 25 feet from the edge of the roof i.e in the middle of the roof is not required to be screened so that was the condition that we circulated um, as the alternative to condition 14 as we uh, reviewed it on on that evening mm -hmm. um, okay all right um so and I think one of the concerns that we had was that this, you know, wh whether we were uh, giving special treatment to a, a town project as opposed to other projects. Um, uh, board members, how do you feel about this condition? I will say that personally, given the, uh, the renderings that were sent, um, you know, the fact that I can see some mechanical equipment from 600 feet away um, seems pretty uh, unobjectionable to me, um, even if it were a commercial project. Um, and I, I do think that the, the view from the public way is what we need to value the most. So how do other people feel? Bruce? Doug, I agree with you. I don't need to say more than that, I don't think. Okay. Um, other board members, uh, if we were to have a motion to adopt the condition that Chris has drafted, uh, uh, what kinds of comments would you have? Janet. I have a question for the, the, the um, designers. Like, does that condition work for you? Does that, I mean, how does that impact the location, the mechanicals. Okay, all right. I, um, Chris, I assume you proposed it after talking with Denisco and the OPM, probably, maybe even I, Kathy, um, about and that that it was all that I assumed it was acceptable to that team. Is that true? Um, yes, I sent that uh, condition with the blanks, um, and I asked Tim Cooper to fill in the blank as to what he would be comfortable with. And he said 25 feet would be uh, reasonable for him. So that's what he proposed. And that's what I just read to you. Um, okay. you, you do have images. I think Tim might have even prepared some more images. I don't know whether you want to look at images of of the mechanical equipment screened um, tonight or whether you're happy with um, that condition. OK. Tim, is there some material that you've, you've presented and you would actually like to share with us? Uh, we have presented uh, or prepared a few images that uh, will further illustrate what you will see and where you can okay. see it from. And if you well, want to look at it, I'm happy to share. Go ahead and, why don't you go ahead and show that? And that way, at least, uh, you know, whatever members of the public are still with us can see what we we probably received in our packets. Uh, one second. And Johanna and Bruce will come back to you after he shows these images. Uh, uh, maybe I can just say that perhaps while this is coming up, I should have said that uh, since the last meeting, I've been appointed to the school building committee. I don't know uh, whether that uh, 
the conflict. I don't think it's a conflict of interest, but uh, it probably should be stated uh, when, as a dec as a as a member declaration. Okay. Thank you, Bruce, and congratulations. Uh, so on the screen now, you can see the roof plan superimposed on the site plan, um, and the typical equipment that we're talking about is located within the center of the roof. There are four major pieces of equipment. Those um, are the are sort of dark gray rectangles that were visible on the on the roof. Okay. Those are the dark gray rectangles. They're air handlers over the gym um, on the third floor high roof and here to the eastern edge of the building. And those pieces of equipment are more than 25 feet away from the roof edge. Um, the language was shared with us by Chris Prescript and uh, it meets the current condition. Um, what this diagram shows is that we do include in the current design screening that will block the equipment um, visually uh, looking from the west, which is the way uh, bus traffic, people entering from the public way, many of the users will approach the building and also approaching from the northwest through the parking lot, the way um, uh, parents dropping off at school. Um, we also included some visuals of what these pieces of equipment actually are. Uh, they are self-contained units with all of the mechanical equipment inside. Uh, they're typically matte, close to sky colored boxes. Um, we don't know the exact color because this is a public project. So we have to give three or equals uh, to meet public bidding laws. Uh, but this is generally what you're looking at. Uh, it is a uh, Depending on the manufacturer, the sizes can vary a little bit, but uh, this particular one, which is the basis of the design for three pieces of equipment is uh, seven foot, six feet tall, and then it will be mounted on a curb. So the total height from the roof will be in the neighborhood of 10 feet. Um, and then the other type is this, uh, another manufacturer, a slightly different type of machinery, but a similar configuration of a, a matte painted box with uh, some ductwork coming out of it. Um, the exact configuration of that ductwork, we don't know because we don't know until we'll know which submitted, um, which equipment we are using. And then we just wanted to illustrate what would we required if uh, we were to totally visually screen all of the equipment from anywhere on the site. We're not including a screen to the west because that's essentially um, wooded land on the east of the Fort River site until you get um, a considerable distance from the site. We don't think anyone will be able to see the equipment from the east side of the building. Uh, but if we were to add screening uh, where the red lines are dashed, um, which would be new in addition to what is already provided in the project. Um, there'd be a couple of impacts. One, uh, a decent amount of the PV solar generation on the roof would be impacted and would have to be moved. Not just the areas that are directly impacted by the added screen, uh, which are the blue rectangles around on all of the roof surfaces, uh, but there is also shadow created by them. If the screens are tall enough to completely block the equipment, they would be about 10, 11 feet tall. Uh, so they have a subsequent shadow, which takes some of the PV, PV that we have shown here out of the picture. And then there's also a cost. Uh, we happen to have a pretty good number of what this would be if we were to place more screen in kind because at DD, we actually eliminated some of this screen wall. So all in total, you're looking at about a 340 linear feet of screen wall and it's, it, with markups, it's about $300,000 for the project to add this. So uh, we just wanted to have that as context for this discussion. And then if you're interested, we have a little bit more uh, modeling from the site that will show you exactly what you'll be able to see uh, in the 3D models that I can share. The equipment is rendered as bright red, uh, so it's perfectly clear what it is, uh, but in real life it would not be, but this is just an illustrative model. Uh, give me one second, I'll pull that up. Uh, 
Um, so this is the path that a parent dropping off at the school would take. You started back at the public way, but now you're coming into the parking lot, driving south through approaching the building. So you can see the rooftop equipment is there. Um, we've painted it red, so there's no mistake that you will be able to see it. Uh, but it is, you know, as the images just shared, it's a, it is a box on the roof. And if we were to build a, a mechanical screen all the way around it, um, it would be significantly more visible. At this point, presumably you're actually looking forward and uh if uh if you were driving uh, hopefully driving, you would be right? there are kids yes um <laughs> but uh for the sake of this conversation we are looking we are a passenger in the car and we are looking at the building okay and so here we are not fully back but almost to the northern end of the athletic fields and so that is that 600 foot number that um you mentioned before that was included in the uh, previous materials that were emailed after this discussion came up. Mm -hmm. And one more since it addresses a specific question. Um, at the very northern edge of the property, at the public way, and in truth, there would probably be some trees that are at the property line obscuring your view from this point. Um, you are considerably north of the entrance drive. But if we were to move along the northern edge of the property line, north of the walking path, north of the athletic fields, looking at the building, you know, you are some... 650, 700 feet away from the building. Uh, so you're looking at a very oblique angle, uh, but you can see the equipment and we've made it red here to make it pop against the building. And there are buildings to the north, a couple of parcels uh, that, you know, we have no intention of saying that you won't see the equipment, but it, there it is. So we didn't talk a lot about the colors of the building itself. Um, is it, you know, from this distance, it feels like if the units and the ductwork were all basically a, a color that was compatible with the rest of the building, it would simply be, you know, those are the, the bumps on the top of the building. Um, is, are you expecting to have that? you know, given that they probably won't be painted red, um, they, you know, I, they will not be painted red. Um, typically manufacturers, um, for the equipment themselves, uh, it's a, a neutral matte color that basically blends in with the sky. Um, and then some things that you may see in addition to the equipment itself are the ductwork that comes out, which is usually not at the top, it's lower to we can't give you a fully accurate representation of how much of that you would see. And you certainly would not see it anywhere close to the building at all. You would have to be very far back, as far back as you are here. Okay. And that we clad in roofing material, which would be neutral and in the character of the rest of the building. Right. Okay, um, Johanna, and then, and then after that, Janet, or maybe Bruce. Thank you. Um, I was just going to, you had asked the question of whether we felt comfortable, and I just wanted to say that I had responded to Chris and said I felt comfortable with the 25 foot um, distance. And then I really appreciate the added explanation from the designers about what additional screening would entail. I think it is definitely not worth losing the rooftop solar capacity or the $300,000. So those are my thoughts. Okay, thanks for that opinion. Bruce? Karen was before me. I wasn't, I did, my hand just went up, but briefly, I agree totally with what Joanna said. Okay, all right. And so, Bruce? but most especially, I, I wanted to thank uh, uh, Tim for this uh, um, very thorough present, you know, no holds barred, I mean, painting the damn thing red for God's sake. 
I have to say it's probably uh, borderline sacrilegious, but I I I, I saw the Pompidou Center in Paris uh, as it was being constructed, <laughs> and I talked to a lot of people, Parisians at the time, and uh, uh, they didn't like it at first, but uh, now it's one of their treasured buildings and it's been repainted. And God damn it, they did it the same way. So you can love this stuff, uh, but we probably won't ever get to it because, frankly, we really never hardly see the damn things. Yeah. So thanks. Tim, that was wonderful. I enjoyed the trip, but uh, you've just made me more uh, emphatically supportive of uh, the uh, uh, the condition that Chris drafted. Okay. All right, uh, Janet. So I, I agree with what people are saying. And I, I, you know, Doug, I was thinking the same thing. I was thinking if it's light colored and match the building, it, it wouldn't cross your mind. So is it an easy fix just mm -hmm. to paint it or just, you know, or whatever. But I, I also think expecting not to see any mechanicals at seven, six or 700 feet seems like a lot to ask. Um, and so I'm, you know, I'm fine, okay. you know, and I, I do appreciate that you made it red. Cause a lot of times when I look at these renderings, they're kind of, sometimes they're very sneaky in a way that favors the project. And you're like, Hmm, that doesn't really, you know, like something seems off or you realize like the sizing and the trees are really huge and you know whatever and people are just really happy walking around all the time and so this is this was like a very negative presentation that i i appreciated <laughs> it was neutral not all right so i think we've got a clear board uh majority that are fine with this condition chris um, you want to take a vote on it? Yeah, I, I, I want to do that. But before I do that, I'm going to put Kathy on the spot. Um, Kathy, as a as the as the head of our school school building committee, and but also as a town councilor, do you feel comfortable with us going ahead with this? Absolutely, hearing that we're not having to put up more screening. I mean, Tim Tim just quickly said that one of the trade-offs we made was uh, uh, to cut the cost of the building, but not hurt the building. We have more insulated windows rather than some screening up on the roof. You know, I mean, there, there were a lot of efforts to keep the integrity. And I think one of the exciting things about this building is it is a net zero. And so what you're going to see is you're going to have solar panels on the roof and this equipment is not burners, you know, it's not oil fuel. So it's sort of a statement. So absolutely I'm delighted that we're not having to spend $300,000 and remove panels <laughs> for, for thing. And the other thing, just people should know, we, we have, um, the first salvo, the the initial site preparation is uh, March 26th is the celebration of it. And that bid came in substantially under what we had estimated. So there is more money in the project, but there's potentially savings along the way, you know, so it, it's toward the building. So it's terrific that you're not increasing the costs of something that almost no one will even know is there. Um, that's great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. You know, it does make me wonder if you're going to save $300,000 at some point. So, uh, okay. All right. So why don't we go through a vote? Um, so um, I think we need a motion to, let's see, we already have a motion and it's already seconded, right? Uh, wasn't that Bruce and Karen? Or did, was I don't that think early? so. I think that was yeah. previously. Okay, yes. that was an earlier one. I guess it's been a long enough night already. That was the continuation, but I. Oh yeah. Okay. All right. I, so in that case, I'll move. Bruce, you want to do another one, or or you want me yeah. to do it? Sure. I'll I'll, I'll move that uh, we uh, support the uh, uh, condition as proposed uh, by the planning director. Okay, I'll second that. All right. Uh, we'll do a roll call vote unless anybody else wants to raise their hand again. Uh, all right, uh, going from the end of the alphabet, Karen. Aye. All right, Johanna. Aye. Janet. Aye. Uh, Bruce. Aye. And I'm an I as well. Okay. 
All right, great. Uh, thank you, uh, Kathy. Thank you all three of you from Denisco. Uh, we look forward to the, I guess it, did you say it was a groundbreaking uh, in March or, or the start of the project of some sort? Um, the initial site prep uh, preparation, March 26, 3.30. Okay. At Fort River. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for staying through most of the evening before we got to you. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. So let's see, I lost my agenda here. Here we go. Okay. All right, Chris, continuing, I guess I'll say the time is now 9.56. Uh, Chris, any other old business not reasonably anticipated? None. All right, how about new business not reasonably? Um, I don't think so. Nate was going to bring something up. Oh, he's here. He, he has been. He's going to yeah. say something about something. Under All right, Nate, Nate anything you want to say? There he is. Uh, I don't think so. Not at 10 o'clock. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, yeah, okay. Thanks. All right. So next is Form A in our subdivision. We do not have any. All right. Uh, ZBA. I haven't received any transmittals, so I have nothing to report. Okay. SPP, SPR, SUB. We do have one. Pam, do you want to describe it? Because you know more about it. Um, well, let's see. The um, Emily Dickinson Museum is working to submit um, a site plan review application. They want to rebuild the carriage house on the Evergreens. So we have most of that together. Um, and we will do a staff review of it and look for a hearing date and we'll keep you aware. Okay, great. Planning board committee and liaison reports. Bruce, anything for PVPC? No. I have nothing for CPAC. Karen, anything for DRB? No. Chris, anything for CRC? Yes, I'm starting to talk to them about the solar bylaw. So that, that should be kicking off, I think, March 26th. OK. Um, OK, uh, next is report of chair. I really don't have anything. But Chris, I do want to ask, when do you think we will introduce the board to uh, our design guidelines team and, and that process? That's a good question. I'll have to work with Nate on that. Um, I see okay. he's still here. That might be a question for him. Yeah. Nate, do you want to comment on when you think um, that team yeah. will be ready to talk to us? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure. We're trying to get stakeholder meetings. Um, was, I was hoping for this week or, and at least next week to get those started. Um, and then, you know, they're hoping to do some existing conditions assessments. They've already been in town. I'd have to look at when they were planning to get in front of, you know, certain boards, but, you know, definitely, um, a you know, a number of members of the planning board were part of a stakeholder meetings. And so then, um, yeah, I, you know, I don't know exactly, you know, when in front of the planning board, but we're trying okay. to get that going, like I said, in the next week or so. Right. Janet, you had a comment? I may have missed this because I missed a meeting. So who are the stakeholders or uh, has that all been identified or who are those who would Nate? Uh, they haven't. Um, we're looking at a few different stakeholder groups. One is um, board and um, committee representatives. One is downtown, you know, property owners and business owners. Uh, one is residents. And then there may be another one. And so each stakeholder group could have, you know, eight to 12 people. And then Dotson is hoping to have a working group of 25 to 30 maybe a few more people that would they'd meet with, um, you know, about six times throughout the process. And they would just be a group that would advise Dodson 
in terms of you know the process. So uh, the stakeholder groups would meet initially to give comments without staff, and then they might be they might meet one more time with Dotson, and then there's this working group that would be meeting you know periodically throughout the the process. Do people volunteer for those things? Or like, is there someone they can contact to volunteer? Yeah, we've been getting emails. So, I mean, if you send something to Chris or myself, if, if people are listening, they could. Okay. And I think Janet and Doug have already said that they wanted to be part of this. So we put your names down on the list of potential stakeholders. So you will be contacted. And I think Karen also said she was interested. So. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, that concludes my report of chair. <laughs> uh, Chris, anything on uh, staff? I have no report. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else want to offer anything that needs to be said at 10.01? I was going to say one other thing. Wayfinders is holding a community meeting over Zoom tomorrow night at 7.00 to talk about uh, their affordable housing project on Belchertown Road and Southeast Street. And so they've already submitted their initial uh, project eligibility letter to the state or the subsidizing agency to begin that comprehensive permit process. And so this public meeting is a chance to hear a presentation from them and then for the public to ask questions or comments of the project. And that's tomorrow night? Tomorrow night, yes. Is that posted on our website? It's on the community calendar. It's not sponsored by a board or committee. Uh, so it's, it's it's been on the trust webpage and it was in the news uh, online. They'll, they'll have other meetings, you know, before they actually submit a comprehensive permit, they hope to have an in-person meeting or a site visit with people. But this is really just to get initial comments as part of this project eligibility phase. Wasn't that service net that was uh, part of, or am I, is that another project? Isn't that a different project? So it's different project. Different project. Yeah. That was Same 20, thing. 20 Belcher Town Road. This yeah. is farther out. Right. Oh. This is, yeah, this is um, the town purchased three properties combined into one at 76 or so Belcher Town Road. So it's uh, a little, past, so almost at the entrance of Colonial Village. And so there's about 45 units proposed there in a new building. And then uh, 30, three units or so proposed on Southeast Street with you know six studios being renovated in the old school building. Right, okay. Yep. Uh, Janet? I'm thinking that that project will go to the ZBA for permitting, but it'd be nice to have them come to us and make a presentation um, for some input. That usually yeah, happens they... after the application is received. So we haven't received the comprehensive permit application. And at that time, we would come to you and ask you if you wanted to review the project to make recommendations. Yeah, okay. we're thinking that the application probably won't be submitted until June or July. Okay. okay. Well, it sounds like we would, you, you don't even need to ask us if we want to see it. I think we want to see it. Sure. Yeah. It sounds very exciting. <laughs> okay. So unless anybody has anything else. We can adjourn. The time is 10.04. Thanks all for sticking in for a long, mm -hmm. what turned out to be a long meeting, but it seemed mm -hmm. like we made good headway on the, the Barry Roberts project. Thank you. Bye. All Bye. Right. Good night. Bye. Bye. Good night. Are you sure you want to start? Yes. <laughs>